Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. It's 9 o'clock. Today is Tuesday, March 9th, 2021. It's 9 a.m. We're in the Century Jury Room of the uh, Hood County Justice Center at 1200 West Pearl Street here in Granbury, Texas. Uh, this morning, once again, Dr. Bill Miller of the Hood County Pastor Council has found us an excellent pastor to give us the invocation this morning. He has been here before. It's Pastor Raul Sandoval of Iglesia Cristiana Vino Nuevo. He is a great guy. He has brought his beautiful daughter here, Bianca, with him, who will be translating. Uh, Pastor Raul Sandoval likes to give his prayers in Spanish, and his daughter will be giving the translation. Am I right, Bianca? Okay, so please, let's all pray. Thank you. Vamos a orar. Let's pray. Señor que estás en el cielo. Jesus Christ, you're in the in the sky. En la tierra, en todo lugar. In the land and all around us. Sabemos que necesitamos de tu sabiduría. We know that we need of your um, wisdom. Te la pedimos en este momento. We ask for it, sir. Por todos estos líderes que dirigen el condado de Hood. With all these leaders that guide us on Hood County. Te pido. We, I ask you que le de la to give them the wisdom. Señor, tú les has dado el conocimiento. Lord, you have given them the strength. Por eso están en este trabajo. That's why they are in this tú job. Los has llamado. You have called them. Por favor, presenta a tu espíritu este día. Please present us with your spirit this day. Dale la sabiduría. Give them the wisdom. Dale el entendimiento. Give them the strength and the um, teachings. De ser líderes en Hood County. To be the leaders of Hood County. Gracias por ellos. Thank you, Lord, for them. Porque tenemos una ciudad hermosa. Because we have a wonderful and beautiful city. Bien dirigida. And with great guidance. Por líderes sabios. By leadership of wisdom. Gracias por ellos. Thank you for them, Lord. Bendícelos. Bless them. Cuida sus familias. Take care of their families. Sus personas. Their person. Cada persona en condado de Hood County. Every uh, person in Hood County. Te lo pedimos. We ask you. Lord. En el nombre de Jesucristo. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, Thank now, you very everyone, much. Everyone, uh, join me in the pledge of allegiance to this great nation of ours. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Liberty, justice for all. The Texas flag, please. On the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you very much. Very, very nice invocation. Thank you both. Thank you for coming. Okay. Today, uh, we're starting something new, as y'all recall, that we're going to have under citizens' comments, we have two parts today, is that on the first, second Tuesday, we have citizens' comments at large. That's where the citizens can talk about any topic that they wish to. It's 30 minutes allocated. So depending on how many speakers there are, we divide the number of speakers by the 30 minutes, and that's how much you will get. So far, uh, I've only, I got two? Yes. I got two. The first one is, and I'll, I'll call them after with it, but I see here that, thank you, is that we do not have any special presentations today and no service awards. Okay, so we're going right into the citizens' comment at large, and I want to tell everybody here that since it's not an agenda item, that none of the commissioners nor myself can respond or ask any questions of anybody that speaks on these at large topics. So they get to say, whatever they want to say, as long as it's with certain purviews of 
decorum and pertain to the county. So the first person is Mr. Steve Biggers. Mr. Biggers, and we have two, so I guess each one of them gets, is, is that another one? Not for that. So under the citizens at large deal, we have two, so I guess I can get 15 minutes apiece. I think it's still limited to five. Is it going to be limited? No, the rule said five, maximum of five. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. I was trying to help you out, Mr. Biggers. Man, oh man, good morning, court. The maiden voyage, I really appreciate this. Holy cow. So a couple things I want to speak to. I'm hoping everybody saw the glowing, glowing article in the newspaper about our command center. There's just a few comments I want to make about that, and then I'm going to go to the crux of my comments. Uh, one, our wonderful fire marshal, uh, he, he's very proud of this unit. And when you uh, read some of these statements that our crackerjack non-biased reporter Kathy Cruz made from Hood County News, he, uh, he's, it, it's pretty much the envy and the jealousy of a lot of departments here in the, in, in the mid-North Texas area. And I really, really think that might be a, a direction that we don't want to look at in the county. We don't want to be envious of other agencies. We want to do the best thing we can for our firefighters out there. Second, there's a, there's a comment from Jay Webster our emergency management million dollar man that we have. And, and um, I'm a little concerned about his outlook. He's defended it a couple times with the fact that, that nothing was wrong. We did it all by the rules. And I found in my history that when you have to do that over and over, then there was a, probably something wrong. And quite frankly, that's not done yet the way this was done with the disrespect of the two precinct chairs that weren't here at the time. Uh, so, and then Mr. Webster says there was no taxpayer dollars taken with this. You know, I, I think the man needs to take a civics course. They're, they're all taxpayer dollars. Whether we borrow it and somebody else has to pay it back, they're all taxpayer dollars. But my crux of why I'm here today is just to get to this point, we kind of had to battle. We had uh, the judge, you defended the old ways of things doing with, with uh, agenda items only, agenda items only. So I, I, I requested and I got some of the expenses that we've been doing with this CARES money. And I was shocked at some of this stuff. So I would, I would encourage people in the audience to take a look and see where you can find some of this stuff. But we're spending thousands of dollars for a janitorial supply company in Stephenville where we have three janitorial supply companies in this county. And we're going down to Caldwell County, Chevrolet dealer there, and we're buying a new truck down there when we have car dealers in this county. We're going to Houston to put boxes in the car dealer. We're going to Weatherford. We're going to Fort Worth to buy trailers and cab covers. Here's the deal. The judge said that we needed to, to abide by the the governor's rules so we can get in all the money we're entitled to. And I have a real problem with the word entitled coming out of any elected official's mouth. So if we're entitled to this, then this is my request. And, and uh, side note, I got, I got to speak to the judge at Collin County and I asked him, because everybody knows he bucked the rules. He, he basically told the governor, no, I respect my businesses and I respect my people and we're going to stay open. And I asked him, how much money did you lose? Every dime they applied for, every dime that they got, everything they applied for. So he, they, they, they did the right thing when it came to the people and the rules. So here's, here's my request, Judge, particularly with your argument with saying anybody, anybody, can have an agenda item put on the agenda, just reach out to your commissioner or your judge. So here's, here's my request, that a future agenda item, hopefully next time around, that you will discuss and take appropriate action to have an outside independent auditing service look at this CARES money and some of the ex expenses they've had. Somebody outside Becky's auditing bean department over here, because we know how she feels about it. She wants a $1.7 million blank check. She wants to pay volunteers. So we need somebody on the outside to look at things that where we're spending our money. There's, there's a place in Fort Lauderdale, Florida that got money from us, and it's a water sports company. 
That needs to be looked into. This stuff needs to be looked into. So I'm asking this court, the judge, here is my agenda item request. Let's put it on the agenda. Let's get an outside auditor to look at these things and find out where this money's going and be responsible and respectful and accountable to the citizens of Hood County. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Biggers. The next person that has five minutes is Mr. Zach Maxwell. Mr. Maxwell. Hello, and thank you. Um, today I'd like to bring to your attention uh, something very important to me um, and something that I've been fighting hard for uh, for the last year. Um, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but Collin County, population of a million, uh, this last week dissolved their uh, local state of disaster for, for COVID. Um, it, it saddens me that you, Ron Massingale, judge with all due respect, and I hope you know that I consider you a friend, I like you as a person, but it's time to stand up and it's time to take back our county. It's time for citizens to be able to go out and freely do what they want. It's time to end the local state of disaster so that way we can all get back to normal. And I hope it's not this new normal that we've all been talking about. But, it, and if you turn around, if you look, people are crammed in. People are crammed into their seats, but we've got seats separated by these red tags. Nobody has anywhere to sit. sit. This was done because a bureaucrat told us that this is how it needed to be done. It's time to stand up and lead. We need leadership, and I ask you that with all due respect, sir. Please end this order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. Then we get down to the regular citizens' comments for pertaining to agenda items. I have four speakers so far. Is that correct, Ms. Lane? Four speakers to speak on one, two, speak on three topics, okay? So that brings us to the consent agenda. Does any commissioner wish to pull <clears throat> any item from the consent agenda? Yes, Judge, I've got one item. Uh, it's gonna be item number F, subsection two. I wanna pull that one off the uh, consent agenda. F2, which is approved under purchasing, approved request of elections and purchasing to declare a list of voting equipment as surplus and explore options for disposal? Yes, sir. Okay. Do I hear a second? Sir. Okay. Motion's been made by Commissioner Eagle, second by Commissioner Wilson to pull from the consent agenda under purchasing F2 the request of elections and purchasing to declare a list of voting equipment as surplus and explore options for disposal. Any discussion? Any questions? I don't know if it takes a vote. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you've got something to speak on, I don't wait to get out of turn here, but I think, Dave, could you speak on this, can't you? Uh, I think. I, well, I was just being out of abundance of caution here. Oh, right. That if the, I mean, I just okay, had a couple of questions. Go ahead. I just had a couple of questions. Okay, and we can probably well, put maybe it right, we can answer them. Probably put it right back on the agenda. Of uh, the consent, uh, <clears throat> so this is this is under purchasing, correct? Yes, sir. So would you mind just explaining to us what what this is about? Y yes. Let me move that up. Yes, basically, purchasing is just requesting uh, to have the old election equipment declared <clears throat> surplus uh, so that we can explore ways of disposal. Now, normally, most surplus <clears throat> items we, we dispose through uh, auction, through Renee Bates auctions. Uh, this in particular, we reached out to them. They said it has, uh, historically, these types of items go for next to nothing, and uh, which, you know, it is what it is, but, um, you know, we also don't want it that these type of equipment going to people with bad intentions. Our other option for disposal of these is to sell them to other counties within Texas. And so my hope was to reach out to other counties already using this type of equipment, seeing if we can get an offer. And at that time, I would bring it back to the court for approval and acceptance of an offer. 
If that doesn't happen, then I would most likely come back and request uh, we put it up for auction. And I just wanted to, the reason, one of the reasons I'm pulling this off the agenda is I wanted you to, on the record, to let people, mm -hmm. the citizens, know what's going on with this. Mm -hmm. Because this equipment, as far as, and of course, the election equipment issue was something that was very near and dear to me. And I had strong feelings about it. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted the public to understand that we're getting ready to surplus this equipment that if we would have gone with the ES and S equipment, they were going to give us $45,200 for this equipment. So I just want that on the record, and I want people to understand that, uh, that basically the, what's behind the, the curtain on this. So I appreciate you letting mm -hmm. us know, and that's, uh, with that said, I'm, we can put it back on the consent agenda as far as okay, I'm concerned. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Tillman, for that explanation. Okay, Judge, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I second it. Okay, the motion has been made by Commissioner Cotton, second by County Judge Massengill to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Okay, that now brings us down to road ops. Mr. Donald Lenny. He has nothing on the program, but I want to congratulate Mr. Donald Lenny and his road ops crew for the magnificent job that they did during the ice storm. I mean, he called his men out, and uh, when they were needed, even TxDOT wanted, called me up in the middle of the night, wanted me to get county equipment to help remove ice off of state highways. And I said, well, I don't know if we have a blades big enough. They wanted two blades and two men. And I said, well, uh, I'll have to call somebody that maybe you're familiar with, and that's Mr. Donald Lenny. And the guy said, oh, yes, Judge, I'm, I'm familiar with him. And I said, well, I can give you his home number. We can, you woke me up so you can wake up Donald Lenny, too, and ask him. And uh, I said, I can't help you there, but Mr. Lenny can. And of course, Don Lenny did come in and help out the state, which is uh, the type of man that Don Lenny is and how his people are. So you do an excellent job. And I want to commend you and Road Ops for doing what you do, Don Lenny. Thank you very much on behalf of everybody in the county. Okay. Okay, that brings us to development. Mr. Clint Head. Morning, Judge. Morning, Commissioners. Development accepted an application for a replat of Hunterwood Lot 4. This replat is in Precinct 2. Staff recommends setting the public hearing for April 13, 2021, Commissioner's Court. Okay. Your motion. Judge, I'll make motion to uh, set a public hearing for the following replat Hunterwood Lot 4R Block 1 in Precinct 2 for April 13th. Your second. Second. Motion been made by Commissioner Cotton to set the public hearing for the replat on Hunterwood. Second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries 5-0. What else you got, Mr. Head? Uh, next item, we have a public hearing of, for the replat of Orchards 12B, lot 3425R, 3426R, and reserve area A1. <clears throat> okay. We're at this time going to convene into a public hearing to discuss and consider for approval the replat just described by Mr. Head. So, Mr. Head, right. continue, please. This replat is being done to adjust the common line of 3425 lot 3426 and reserve area A. It'll be creating a 9.13 of an acre lot called 3425R, a 9 point, or 0 0.935 of an acre lot called 3426R, and a 3.048 acre lot called reserve area A1. The property is located in the water quality district in precinct two and is served by AMUD water and sewer. Staff has reviewed this replat. All comments have been addressed and recommends approval of the replat as presented. Okay. Any, let's see, that was not no. Judge, this is out in the Pecan Plantation. It's a new area that they've developed, and uh, there's a common area in there, and uh, the developer was wanting to uh, make some changes in those lots to, uh, I think, decrease, or were they increase they the were lot increasing size? the lot lines? <coughs> 
So uh, I don't see anybody out here wanting to speak, and it's not really a, a, a large deal. So uh, I would, uh, if no, well, you could. Yeah. Okay, so any further discussion? Okay, we're going to reconvene back into Commissioner's Court, and do I hear a motion? I'll make that motion, uh, Judge, to uh, approve the uh, following replat, Orchards 12B, Lot 3425R and 3426R, and Reserve Area A1. I hear a second. Second. Okay, motion's been made by Commissioner Cotton to approve the replat on Orchards 12B lots 3425R, 3426R, and the reserve area A1, second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Okay. The next item, we have a public hearing for replat of 144, please. Okay. We're going to reconvene now into a public hearing to discuss the replat on 144 place. This replat is of lot one, 144 place, and a one acre track that is part of the E.J. Johnson survey abstract 292. This replat is being done to adjust the common line between lot one and the unplatted one acre track to the south to correct for a building encroachment. It will be creating a 2.979 acre lot called lot 1R and a 1.022 acres lot called lot 1R1. This property is in the Road Corridor District in Precinct 2 and is served by well and on-site sewage facilities. Staff has reviewed this replat. All comments have been addressed and recommends approval as presented. Okay. Any comments or questions? Okay. We're going to reconvene back into Commissioner's Court. Do I hear a motion regarding approval of the replat at 144 place? Judge, I'll make the motion to... Uh Approve the following replat 144 place lots 1R and 1R1 in precinct 2. Second. Motion been made by Commissioner Cotton to approve the replat at 144 place. Second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Third, we have another public hearing for the replat that is subdividing a lot 33R, the orchards on the Brazos. Okay, we're going to reconvene now into a public hearing to discuss the replat. Right. This replat is the lot 33 on orchards on the Brazos will be creating a 2.707 acres lot called lot 33R1, a 2.18 acres lot called 33R2 and a 3.286 acres lot called 33R3. This lot was originally platted as three lots and was replatted into a single lot and this replat is being done to go back to the three individual lots. This property is located in the Water Quality District in Precinct 2 and served by public water and on-site sewage facilities. Staff has reviewed this replat. All comments have been addressed and recommends approval as presented. Okay. Any comments or questions? Okay, we're going to reconvene back into Commissioner's Court then to consider the approval. Do I hear a motion on the orchards on the Brazos? Judge, I'll make the motion uh, to approve the following replat, the orchards on the Brazos, box 33R1, 33R2, 33R3. Second. Okay, a motion been made by Commissioner Cotton to approve the Orchards on the Brazos replat on lots 33R1, 33R2, and 33R3, second by Commissioner Eagle. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Lastly, we have a final plat to discuss and consider of Vista Oaks, phase one, lots two through 12 of block two. This is a portion of the concept plan of Vista Oaks that was approved at the December 22nd, 2020 Commissioner's Court. The property is located at 601 Williamson Road. The gross area for this final plat is 23.564 acres of the J Building Survey, abstract number 60, the J Wilcoxon Survey, abstract number 579. This final plat is located in the Road Corridor District in Precinct 2 and will be served by well and on-site sewage facilities. 
This proposed final plat will create 11 single family lots. The largest proposed lot size will be 2.475 acres and the smallest will be 2.043 acres. There are no stre streets proposed with this final plat. The proposed lots will access existing Williamson Road. Staff has reviewed this final plat. All comments have been addressed and staff recommends approval as presented. Okay. Did you, uh, did you say it's on the well and? Well and on-site sewage. On-site sewage, okay. Uh, Judge, I'll make the motion to approve the following final plat. Well, we have Mr. Joe LaCroix here that wants to speak. Mr. La LaCroix. <coughs> Judge Commissioners, good morning. Joe LaCroix with Baird Hampton Brown Engineering here on behalf of the developer. Um, we would be happy to answer any questions that you have. I think Clint did a perfect job covering our, uh, our platform. You're for it. I'm sorry? You're for this. I am for this, <laughs> yes, sir. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Good deal. Anybody have any questions here of Mr. LaCroix? Okay. Thank you for coming back again, Mr. LaCroix. We appreciate your attendance. Okay. All right. Uh, do I hear a motion regarding approval of the final plan on Vista Oaks, phase one? Yes. I'll make the motion to approve the uh, following final plat, uh, Vista Oaks, phase one. A motion been made by Commissioner Cotton to approve the final plan on the Vista Oaks, phase one. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Andrews. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Head. Good job, as always. Okay, financial. A newcomer here, Ms. Becky Kidd. How are you? <laughs> Good morning, Judge and Commissioners. Last court, I forgot to thank probably the most important two people that managed to get court done. The sheriff went out and picked up my employee, Cynthia, and she came in and worked, and she's the, the key to getting court done, and I forgot to thank them, so I'd like to thank the sheriff and Cynthia for helping last court. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. You're welcome. For this court, you've all received a spreadsheet of invoices over $10,000. Are there any questions? If just, not... Just a quick one on the two trucks for the road ops. We had these in the budget, right? That's in his budget. Right. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. The, payment, the invoices for this court total $426,140.33. We have reviewed these invoices and recommend payment. Any comments or questions to Ms. Kidd? Do I hear a motion? I make a motion we pay the bills. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, motion been made by Commissioner Eagle to pay the invoices in amount of $426,140.33, second by Commissioner Wilson. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Next. My second item is the, to accept the financial review of the sheriff commissary inmate and bail bonds records. We've reviewed all these. We've also issued a letter to jail standards saying that everything is complete. There are no issues with it. That is a compliance part of what we do every year. There was only one small issue with deposits and that's been uh, rectified. We ask that you accept this report. Okay, any comments or questions to Ms. Kidd about the sheriff's commissary inmate and bail bonds? If not, do I hear a motion? I move that we accept the 2021 review of the sheriff's com commissary inmate and bail bond financial records. Okay, second. Motion been made by Commissioner Wilson to accept the 2021 review of the Sheriff's Commissary Inmate and Bail Bonds Financial Records, second by Commissioner Eagle. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kidd. Okay, under miscellaneous, item number one, discuss and take appropriate action to appoint Scott London, Chief Deputy Constable, Precinct 4, the illustrious Mr. Chad Jordan and Mr. Scott London. How are you doing, Scott? Good to see you. Good, good. Judge, commissioners, uh, since uh, Kevin Sklark uh, has left the office, we've uh, gone through the process of searching and trying to find a suitable person to, to serve the needs in Precinct 4 and in the county as a whole due to the fact of so many things that we encompass. And the person we've come up with is Scott London. He comes to us with over 21 years experience and a former elected official of Eddy County, New Mexico. 
and uh, will fit right in. He's converted his stuff over to Texas, which we're excited about and look forward to having him serve the citizens of Hood County. Would you like to say a few words, Mr. London? Uh, I'm just really excited about the opportunity to come work for the county. Good. Anybody else on the commission have any comments or questions of either? I have one. <coughs> have you got your TCO certifications up to date? I passed the test, what was it, three weeks ago? Three weeks ago, 100%. Okay. I'm just making, you know, making sure. Absolutely. As a TCO instructor, I want to make sure. Thank you. <laughs> this guy right here is on top of it, isn't he? That's good. Okay. Any other comments or questions to either Constable Jordan or soon to be Constable Mr. London? Okay, do I hear a motion? Yes, sir, Judge. I, I make the motion that we appoint Scott London Chief Deputy Constable for Precinct 4. I hear second. a second. Second. Okay, a motion's been made by Commissioner Eagle to uh, appoint Scott London, Chief Deputy Constable for Precinct <coughs> 4, second by Constable Wilson. Uh, Constable Wilson. <laughs> no. <laughs> Those days are gone, oh, sir. <laughs> well, he used to be a constable. I want you to know that. He's been a lot of things since then. But Commissioner Wilson, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion's unanimous, 5-1. Congratulations. Oh, Good luck you to you. I appreciate it. Okay, item number two under miscellaneous. Discuss and take appropriate action to allow Mission Granbury and CASA of Hood, <clears throat> Somerville County, the placement of CASA blue fags and blue spotlights around the courthouse for the month of <coughs> April, which is Child Abuse Awareness Month. Additionally, allow the Paluxy Rivers Children Advocacy Center to tie blue ribbons at the square for the same time period. And boy, do we have two advocates here with us today. Welcome, both ladies. I guess I'm going to have to defer to my queen first. <laughs> By the way, Jean Kate was the first bean queen of Hood County. So, and I always refer to her as Her Highness. So, anyway. I appreciate the honor. The honor. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much for allowing us time this morning. Child abuse is such a horrible thing, and we'd like to think that we don't have it in Hood County, but unfortunately we do. And so anything we can do that calls attention to uh, the problem of child abuse uh, is very, very helpful. It makes people stop and think, and parents can explain to their children the reason why these blue flags are flying. And so we appreciate your approval to display the blue flags around the courthouse and to also put the uh, blue lights on the courthouse. And then I defer to Margaret. Thank you, Judge, uh, council members. We um, want to put our wooden blue ribbons that we've done every year on the square. We put them in the corners. Uh, that have been made, and it is to raise awareness for Child Abuse Prevention Month. We have a lot of activities. This is just like the beginning of the month. We'll have blue ribbons. Our idea is to blanket the community and raise the awareness. There is concern with all the, the lockdowns the past year. We've all had to shelter in place, and children are not being uh, recognized for the signs of abuse, and, and we're really doing what we can to beef up the awareness and prevention. Tracy Cooper's here, our educational coordinator, and she's been out there talking to every school and person you can get to talk to. We'll have a lot of community activities going on as well. But we do want permission to put up our, our blue ribbons on the square as well. I just want to congratulate you and you and you for the absolute wonderful job you did at the a banquet that was held at uh, La Vista, uh, La, Bella La Bella Luna. Thank you. Would you tell the people here in the audience just how much money was raised in that one night at the auction and the dinner? Do you, it, it was an astronomical amount of money that we every, did. We did really well. We had our Cinderella Ball Gala, which had been delayed several times over the past year, and uh, we're we're thinking we're going to net around sixty thousand dollars. So Six. once all the expenses are paid, we had an amazing turnout with our live auctions, our silent auction, and sponsors who gave up tables so we could bring other sponsors in so we could maintain the capacity limits and just really blessed that the community supported us so well. You both do such an outstanding job in that 
recording. Y'all had a video that was put out that would, if that wouldn't tuck at your heart strings and your purse strings, because it did exactly what you two intended, or you three intended it to do with all the other help. But that was a fabulous, fabulous fundraiser. Thank it was you. great for the community. And so I, I move that we <laughs> allow Mission Granbury and Casa Hood Somerville the placement of the blue flags and the spotlights around the courthouse for the month of April, which is Child Abuse Awareness Month, and allow the Paluxy River Children's Advocacy Center to tie blue ribbons at the square for the same time period. Do I hear a second? second. We got two seconds. Everybody, Everybody on the court. <laughs> Thank you. The whole commissioner's court ex uh, seconds that motion. That's how we're for you. By the way, before we vote on this, I just, um, I'm not going to give away anybody's age here, but somebody is sitting at the podium right now. It's 91 years age, and she's still going strong, too. I mean, real strong. And I still drive a pickup. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. And she drives a pickup truck. That's what I like about her. So it's very wonderful. Thank you, thank you ladies, thank both you of much, you, Jeff. very, very much. And thank you all for all that you all do for the children of Hood County. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What a wonderful deal. Okay. Item number three. Discuss and take appropriate action on requests from the Granbury Wine Walk. I'll second it so I guess that's We need to vote on that. <laughs> I thought we did. Oh, we did. Oh, we just all seconded it. I figured we're going to all vote on it. Yeah. <laughs> all those in favor of allowing the appropriate action of Mission Granbury and Casa and the child, the Paluxy River Children's Advocacy Center, to do whatever they want to do to the square and putting up their flags and blue <laughs> lights and flags and tie ribbons and anything else they want to do. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Well, that's unanimous. Thank you all all very, very much. Please come back and see us whenever you need anything. Yes. One, one more comment. Back in July of last year, one of my commitments as being on court was 10% of my salary, gross, not base, every month, month of March and April, goes to that, those two organizations right there. Thank you. Well, that's good. Worthy cause, if there's anything. Yes. That's, I'll tell you what, our abused children and our elderly, not you, Gene Kate, <laughs> <laughs> but our other elderly, and not you either, Kay. Okay. Everybody else that's elderly, but not you too. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Item number three discuss and take appropriate action on the Granbury Wine Walk related to vendor parking around the historic courthouse during the wine walk on Friday, April the 23rd, from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., Saturday, April 24th, from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., and Sunday, April the 25th, from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Is there anybody here from the Granbury Wine Walk here today? I don't, I know that Chuck Taglioni has talked to the city, has talked to the chamber, and they had asked me to sponsor this. And what they have intended to do is to block off a part of Crockett Street there and part of what they did from, um, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the, the street right in front of uh, Christina's and Oz. What's that street there? My mind just went blank. From the, what? No, it's not Bridge Street. Bridge Street's the other one. The other one that runs Houston. Houston, from Houston Street. From the corner, up there where Reds is and where the O, for the end of that first block there, and the southern half of the courthouse square, so that people could still come in, the traffic could still enter from the west entrance right there on Houston Street and could come around the courthouse and get around, but they are really planning a big event. This is what Tammy Dooley and Chuck Taglione and 
Tiberius and Sissy uh, Andrews have, have said that it's going to be maybe make Granbury the hub of a wine center just like Grapevine is. I mean, it could be really important and bring a lot of people here into Hood <laughs> County. So they are really planning. The merchants are with uh, Chuck Taglione, and they have really worked together. And uh, I really think that this is a worthwhile endeavor. It will really put Hood County and Granbury on the map and help out all of Hood County. So I want to make a motion that we allow these times to related to the vendor parking around the courthouse on those dates that I just stated into the record. So uh, you judge I'll second that if I could add if you don't mind. Uh, last year we had to the wine walk was canceled as you know because of the uh, the COVID stuff and um, this this uh, event was kind of spearheaded originally by uh, Tiberia of Barking Rocks Winery and, and Sissy Andrews and they're uh, in the, they're passing the batons so to speak this year uh, since, you know we weren't able to do it last year and so Chuck is gonna is take it over they're extending it from it's always been two days Friday and Saturday uh, now they're going to extend it to that third day, uh, partially because they're trying to limit how many people can come each day. Uh, so just wanted to throw that out there that it's it's kind of a inaugural uh, uh, deal for the baton change, and so uh, I think it's a great event for. It's always been a very good event for Granbury. It's been very well attended and. Uh, we always get a blue norther that come in on Friday night, so we've got that's been scheduled, and so uh, I'm sure you know that that may happen. It seems like it always does, but just want to throw that in. It's a great event, all right. And uh, there's really good cheese being sold up there too. <laughs> <laughs> that's self-plugging, and we don't allow self-plugging up here. But uh, and I would like to say is that Tiberius and Sissy put this on. For 20 years, I think it was 20 years. That 10 or 11. They, they started in 2009. Was the first year 2009. So they've been close working enough. Very, it's been a long time, and they're just tired, and they work with Chuck. So everybody is really working together, and I'm really proud to see that the Merchants Association, the Chamber of Commerce, everybody really does want this, and I think it's a wonderful idea to have it. So having made the motion by the judge, second by Commissioner Eagle. Do I hear any other questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries, 5-0. Okay, next, discuss and take appropriate action to allow IT to purchase equipment, computer equipment and server equipment totaling $223,100 out of Fund 55. Mr. Drew Whitaker. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, so originally, that was the quote that I was going for. I've actually lowered it down to 216. Um, I was working with Kevin Andrews, Commissioner Andrews, and he requested that I lowered, take some of the equipment off. Um, originally, the 223 quote was we were going to order more equipment due to the four to six month lead time in order to receive it all. Um, but now that that is not the case anymore, we're able to reduce our numbers um, to have a cheaper price. Um, to do a little history here, every year, generally speaking, we go through and we order a bulk order because we can get everything for a lot cheaper at a reduced price um, out of Fund 55. And of course, two years ago, the court, the court before you, you know, agreed to put this money in my hardware cost budget. However, due to COVID and the county budget taking a cut across the board in all departments, I am not able to fund this this year. And that is why I'm requesting it to come out of Fund 55. Okay. Uh, I understand. Uh, Sharon, is Sharon, here's another lady you don't want to tangle with here, Ms. Sharon Sealander either. 
She wants to speak on item number four. That is correct, right? Sharon? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, as you know from the software committee, we've been out doing some investigation and research. And I've met with Drew at one time talking about the equipment. And I have to agree with this. This is something definitely the county needs is this upgrade in equipment. Our equipment's getting to the point that um, it's not really that useful anymore. I understand and I think, correct me Drew if I'm wrong, that there's some persons that weren't able to even connect remotely uh, due to the type of equipment, the server equipment we have there when the winter crisis was going. So that's something that definitely needs to be done. I think everybody should be, at one, you know, be able to, to uh, uh, connect to the equipment remotely to do their job if they have to. So I think our equipment's getting a little too old to be useful. So I'm for it. Okay, well mm -hmm. good, thank you. Anything thank you, Ms. Lander. Okay, anybody else have any other questions or comments considering item number four? I just, I would like to throw in that this, uh, this equipment has historically gone through Drew's, uh, Drew's department, but it goes to all the people in the county. And so just wanted to make sure, you know, people understood that it's, it's, it's not that he's asking for more equipment for his, uh, his department as much as th th that the equipment filters through his department. And this is for all the, all the offices in the county that require new upgrades. Is that correct? That is correct. Our budget is for the whole county. Any further questions or comments? If not, do I hear a motion? Judge, I'll make the motion to uh, allow IT to purchase cu uh, computer equipment and server equipment totaling $216,000 out of Fund 55. Second. Okay, it was motion been made by Commissioner Andrews to allow IT department to purchase computer equipment and server equipment as stated. Second by Commissioner Wilson. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank you, Drew. Okay, next item, item number five discuss and take appropriate action regarding the refurbishment of engine 26. Fire Chief Jeff Young. Yes, sir, Chief. Judge, Commissioners, I believe this was approved in the budget hearings back in October, but in order to keep everything up on the up and up, we wanted to run it through again and just make sure that it gets approved. Okay. Ms. Kidd, that is correct. That was in the budget that we did vote on, didn't we? We listed those out, those items that would be coming out of capital. Yes. Okay, so we've already planned for it in the budget, and this is what you just wanted to bring it up here for transparency purposes. Am yes, I sir. Correct? Okay. And, and to get your signature on the contract. And, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate signing my signatures for like 300,000 when one's coming up for only a half a million, so. Anyway, does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, John, I, I would like to commend Jeff what he's done to to work with this manufacturer. This we've had some some issues with this. This is you know, and then of course we had the the COVID slowdown, and uh, Jeff has really had to go back and 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 beat on the uh, manufacturer to get this thing with some stipulations where if they don't deliver on time like they've promised, that there's a little bit of a penalty in there, and uh, he's assured me that they've never done that anything like that before so this I'm, is the first refurb they've ever done that on yeah so I am you know I'm excited to see these things moving forward uh, getting back to getting these these engines up to, up to snuff thank you good, good work Jeff. thank you sir okay one further comment in talking with Jeff there was a delay in getting to this point because you know the vendor was balking at the penalty clause that we were requested be put in the contract. If they don't deliver in the time frame, there will be a penalty clause, and that is in the contract. And they did balk at that for quite some time. But you know, this is something that is needed. It was needed, you know, from the very beginning on the initial one. So yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Now I forgot. Did we have a motion. Uh, I don't think so. I'll make that motion, Judge. To okay. <laughs> okay, motion been made by Commissioner Andrews to take the uh, appropriate action regarding the refurbishment of engine number 26, second by? I second. Commissioner Wilson. 
All those in favor say aye. I got a aye. question. I got a question first, Camp. Okay, sure. Uh, has the uh, county attorney reviewed this contract? Uh, Matt, may I ask? Did you review the contract? Yes. Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, okay, now that you asked a question, I got one more. Is there, did, did you say a number on this? Did you give us a number? Uh, the, the total that I have on this right now is $314,935. That's different from what you said, isn't it? Yep. No, it's 314. That's what I've got. 314,935 dollars. Is that what you said? Uh, that was on the last. That was on the computer equipment that I gave a number. I oh, didn't okay. give a number on this one. All right. Is that the number? 314. That's what's on the paperwork. Yeah. Okay. And I think when we discussed it back when we were doing the budgets, it was set at 325 or up to 325,000, because once they get it there and get it tore apart, I mean, there there is the possibility they could find something that's damaged beyond and, and, and that could change okay but th that's that's the number that he sent me on the refurb for the scope of work that we've outlined already so could, could i amend the motion to up to three hundred twenty five thousand? okay okay so correct Please do. okay yeah. and of okay, course it, it, if they get there and they get it tore down and there's anything that changes i'll definitely bring come and, and make sure that you're all aware of that Okay, now the motion made by Commissioner Andrews is that w the county can spend up to $325,000 for the refurbishment of Engine 26, second by Commissioner Wilson. Wilson. Okay. By the way, Commissioner Wilson was the one that really wanted that penalty in there. I mean, he, he fought, and I agreed with him, and I think Matt Mills will agree with us too that that was pretty a hard concession. They had never given that before, but really a good job doing that. Thank Gee, you. Really a good job, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Okay. All those in favor of spending three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars up to three hundred twenty-five thousand for the refurbishment of Engine Twenty Six, say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries 5-0. Thank Thanks, you, sir. Chief. You want me to go ahead and sign that? If you want. So when do you send that down there? Um, as soon as they say that they have 90% or more of the parts on hand, that's when it that doesn't do us any good with it sitting in the parking lot. Thank you very much. Doing a good job. Okay. All right. Item number six, discuss and take appropriate action to approve all Hood County Department heads and elected officials with direct contact numbers for the IT Department and IT Department Assistant Chief Information Oper Operations. This number to be utilized for emergency response only. This is in addition to the after hours phone number. Okay. You want to explain that, Commissioner Wilson? This is a direct result of an event that happened right at the end of the cold snap where jury selection was on again, off again, on again, off again, and jurors, potential jurors showed up on Monday morning to only be told that there was no jury selection that day. Then and you know, doing research after the fact, found out that the party that was supposed to be trying to get something put on the county website and on Hood County News was able to reach any and every uh, anybody at that point. What this does is allow department heads and elected officials the right, you know, the capability, not the right, the capability of contacting IT to get something immediately put on in the case of emergency only. This is not normal everyday business. There is a the phone number that's listed for you know normal everyday business. That was an issue. The county took significant uh, Facebook hits because of that event, and this is what I'm proposing that we do to prevent that from happening again. So I can add to it. So what I've done, um, generally speaking, we have an after hours number. 
Of course, everyone generally has my uh, cell phone number, mine and Owen's cell phone number. So what I've done is I've shot out multiple emails reminding department heads of the after hours emergency contact number. And I've also sent out a separate email to department heads with my personal cell phone number in case for some reason they call the emergency number and do not get anyone. Um, I've also requested that the department heads for some off off the wall reason, those two don't work, you can't get me on my cell phone or the after hour emergency number to send me and Owen both an email. Um, because we, myself and Owen, generally work the weekends as well, answering questions or anything you know related to that in case there is anything that possibly could come up that needs to be posted or anything of that uh, sort. So I just want to say I took care of it already. Okay. 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 Do I hear a motion? So moved. Okay. A second. I hear a second. What is the motion? The motion is that Drew and Owen have furnished their uh, a personal cell phone numbers in addition to the emergency numbers that are in effect in case there is a real emergency outside of normal working. And outside of using the, the, the after hours phone number. Yeah. Outside of using after hours. Like. Yeah, I'll say it. Okay. So a motion been made in second, and I think Drew's already taken the appropriate action to give us his and Owen's <coughs> personal cell phone numbers in addition to the after hours phone numbers in ex cases of extreme emergencies. So all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Drew and Owen. Okay, item number seven. Consider and take appropriate action on the following items for the AMUD sewer project grant. Authorize the county judge to sign a the agreement between the Texas Department of Agriculture and the County of Hood, contract number 7220191 for the Community Development Fund. We have Ms. Jeannie here, and we also, is that Richard? Yes, it is. In person. Hey, it's been it's been in person. I just, <laughs> this guy is. If you don't mind, can I go ahead and just kick it off? Yes, yeah. that's fine. I want you to know this. It, when I saw this and was reading all this, we all got together, what was it, two weeks ago, I think, mm -hmm. it? two weeks ago on the phone, and right. I just always glanced through there and see how many pages, and then I kind of looked for the dollar amounts, and when I saw $500,000, right. I started reading it real carefully then from page <laughs> one of the thing. Oh, yeah, so. that, it's a wonderful thing. This, you know, this has been a, a, a two-year process you know, with the application, and I know there's been all kinds of setbacks, you know, for, for different reasons, but uh, TDA came through for us. Uh, they've approved the funding. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, we're targeting uh, 40 new service connections for uh, folks in uh, Port Ridgely East that qualify for the grant funding. So uh, we're, we're just looking forward to hitting the, hitting the ground running, uh, Judge, and, and as always, appreciate y'all's support because we wouldn't be able to do this project without you know, y'all having our back, so appreciate it. Well, thank you for all your hard work, and I feel like that you really represented AMUD and also Hood County in getting this, so it's good for the whole county here. And Absolutely. Jeannie and Clint and a bunch of us were up there talking on on deals, and we I understand that we have Wesley Trailer that's on the grant side of this right. that's available if we need to talk to him, but I believe that we have, I don't have any questions of him. Do, do you, Jeannie, or Clint? I mean, I think it's really been thought out, like you said, it's been two years right. in the making, and I think it's a very good project. Absolutely. So, Richard, isn't this, the, isn't this the third one you've done? You've done one or two, I know. I was uh, there. I believe we, this is the fourth one, actually. Fourth one we've yeah. done in Fort Ridgely. Yeah, about and, and, and it should be the final one. This covers that, the, get them all uh, covered. the last of the remaining areas. Great, so. great. So. He's kind of prejudiced, though. He's used to be a <laughs> board member on AMA, didn't he? Imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's one who took care of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Okay, is there any further comments or questions? Do I hear a motion? I'll make the motion, uh, Judge, uh, for the AMUD sewer, sewer Project Grant. Uh, doesn't give the amount, but to approve the the uh, sewer project grant. 
you know, authorize me to go ahead and sign this contract. And I authorize the judge to sign it. <laughs> okay. Second. All right. Motion been made by Commissioner Cotton to authorize the county judge to sign the agreement between the Texas Department of Agriculture and County of Hood, contract number 7220191 for the Community Development Fund, second by Commissioner Wilson. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Mr. English, thank, thank you. you for all you do for the thank county. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Appreciate you. Okay, item number eight, discuss and take appropriate action regarding an unused office space in the purchasing department to be utilized by the audit department. Glenn Tillman. Yes, Judge Commissioners, uh, we have a, a room that we've been using for storage and it's been nice, but it's really not necessary for us. Uh, auditing has a, has a true need for additional office space, so uh, uh, we've, we're glad to uh, uh, offer them that uh, that space for their use. So we're not fighting over territory here. This is an uh, agreement between both of you. Yes, sir. I just what I like to see. So everybody's in agreement. Yes, That's sir. That's great. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Do I hear a motion? I move that we just, you know, take the appropriate action to re reissue, reuse the additional office space in the purchasing department be utilized by the audit department. I second it. Okay. So motion been made by Commissioner Wilson to take the appropriate action to let the audit department use the office space that was used for storage in the purchasing department mm -hmm. to be used in the audit department and I understand from talking to both of you that our good maintenance director Jay Riley said he could do it out of his own budget because all he's doing is talking about put buying a door and some very other minor changes am I correct and he said yes. he could do it out of his own budget yes, that's correct. okay so with that deal uh, any further comments or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank Mr. Tillman and Ms. Kidd very much for working that out, please. Okay. All right, next. Request approval to award RFB 2021-005 polypropylene piping for drainage culvert rehabilitation contract to advance drainage systems. Oh, that's a, did you write that sentence? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, okay. that's a mouthful. The, the bids for polypropylene piping for drainage culvert rehabilitation, RFB 2021-5, were open March 2nd at 2 p.m. in the purchasing department. After examining the one qualified response, it is the uh, request of purchasing to award the contract to advanced drainage systems. And uh, I did uh, uh, consult with... Uh, uh, Mr. Lenny on that, and he was uh, was in agreement with that. Just for clarity, uh, Mr. Lenny, you want to tell us what that's about? What are you What are you doing with that? Just so we know what we're purchasing and why we're doing it. Well, at the moment, at uh, at a subdivision called Oak, uh, Oaks at Fall Creek, uh, they have one entrance, <clears throat> and that entrance goes across of a creek. That's it's a concrete. It's got eight 48 inch pipe under it and with this polypropylene uh, actually we can sleeve these these pipe and last the rest of its its time but what's happened it's it's eroded the pipe the cmps that are in there have eroded and without doing away with their only access this would be the best way to to remedy this situation thanks you're in approval yes sir okay all right any other comments or questions Okay, I'll call the question. Anybody make a motion? I'll make the motion to approve uh, the approval of award RFB 2021-005 polypropylene piping for the drainage culvert rehabilitation contract to advance drainage systems. I'll second that. Okay. Motion's been made by Commissioner Cotton to purchase this piping. Second by... Commissioner Andrews. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries 5 0. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, item number 10 discuss the powers and duties of a county commissioner 
and Commissioner's Court under Texas Constitution Article 5, Section 1, and Texas Local Government Code, Section 81.001, et cetera, with regard to contracting. Commissioner Eagle. Okay, uh, thank you, Judge. Um, I've got three items in sequential order here. I just felt like there was some, uh, there's a maybe some misunderstanding out here in the county on who's supposed to be doing what with regard to certain items. I'm going to pass down a just one page uh, right taken out of Texas Association of Counties, uh, their website. <clears throat> And I want to start out with the commissioner's court, and I think I've mentioned this before, but I want to get it out there that uh, commissioner's court is a constitutional court under Article 5, Section 1 of the Texas Constitution. And uh, in addition to the constitutional authority for the commissioner's court, we are also under uh, the Texas Local Government Code, Section 81.001 at SEEK. And 8101 lays out powers and duties of the commissioner's court, so it expands on the constitutional authority. And uh, many of us refer to the Texas Association of Counties for, uh, to help us interpret uh, statutes, interpret uh, who's supposed to be doing what. And I, I passed down the one page uh, document from the Texas Association of Counties with regard to contracts and uh, if you look down at, at the two for the fifth bullet point, it, it basically says that the commissioners have exclusive authority to authorize contracts. And uh, I'm going to, I also cited in my agenda item the 2018 Guide for Texas Law for County Officials. And that's a 168 page document that is, uh, that has been put out by the Texas Association of Counties. And actually, it was prepared by a guy, a lawyer out of uh, Austin. His name is David Brooks. And uh, I, my understanding is that Mr. Brooks is actually one of our county attorney's go-to resources uh, is if he has, if Mr. Mills has a specific question that he wants uh, either clarity on or, or guidance or what have you. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, and this 168-page uh, treatise, uh, 2018 Guide to Texas Laws for County Officials, uh, it's a, if you ever get bored sometime and want to go uh, read yourself to sleep, uh, this is a great document to pick up. Uh, as I said, it's 168 pages and it lines out what the county judge does, the tax assessor, collector, county clerk, county treasurer, district, district clerk, sheriff, JPs, uh, constables, county attorney, DA, county auditor, and the county surveyor, as well as the commissioners. And out of the 168 pages of that document, uh, 61 pages go to the powers and duties of the commissioners. Uh, the commissioner's court is, has the general responsibility for conducting the business of the county. And we also have the exclusive authority, as I spoke before, uh, to contract. Uh, if you look under the, there's a section in this booklet uh, that I cite in my agenda item, Guide to Texas Laws, there's seven pages in that document devoted strictly to contracting that the commissioner's court is empowered to do. Uh, you can find contracting authority under local government code, government code, transportation code, health and safety code, utilities code, human resources code, parks and wildlife, elections code, labor code, et cetera. Several, several places or several codes that pull in the commissioner's court power and duties as far as contracting is concerned. Uh, I wanted to get this first part on the table about the power and duty of the commissioners with regard to contracting because again we have exclusive authority to do so on behalf of the county and I wanted to open it up for discussion with the other commissioners to see if anybody had any question comments or other ideas about what our powers and duties are regarding uh, 
executing a contract? Well, I think that there's no question we have the authority to enter into contracts, but just like Commissioner Cotton just do here, every time when we have a contract prior to the commissioners voting on it, we asked Matt Mills, our county attorney, which is in what you just cite here, under his preview to give us his approval. We always ask him, Matt, have you read the contract and do you approve it? And if he does approve it, we do that. I'm an attorney, Mr. Eagle's an attorney, but we always ask Mr. Mills to read it and see if it's legal or not. And like he says, he can consult the guy who wrote this or, or anybody else, Secretary of State, the AG's office. A lot of people are at his disposal to find out. I know that I rely on Matt Mills a lot, and I do compliment Mr. Mills in that I have never had Mr. Mills failed to get back to me in a very timely manner on anything that I've ever asked him to do. I think the last time I called him at Sunday night, 9 o'clock at night, and he got back to me at 9.15. I thought that was a little tardy, but uh, I'll let him slide on that. But I go to him to ask for his approval, and without his approval, I doubt very seriously if I'm going to vote for anything. So I'm going to, that's his job, he's an elected official, and just like Mr. Cotton just asked him, he said, have you looked at that and then have you reviewed it and approved it? So I don't disagree with what Mr. Eagle has to say on this thing and we should all work together. We want to do everything that's legal and by the book. I've always said that we got to do things legal. There's no shortcut. You've got to do things legal. So I asked Mr. Mills his opinion about everything, and I think everybody on this commission here has asked him for his approval on any written contract that's ever come before this commission, uh, this court since I've been on this court. So i just like to add that. That's not contradicting what you say, but I'm saying that the county attorney is a very, very important person on approving any contract. Anybody so, else have any comment? So, in other words, you've moved into the next agenda item, uh, which uh, have we covered the powers and duties of the commissioner's court? Do I hear, do I, you know, hear that as we've covered the the commissioner's responsibilities as far as uh, item number ten uh, with our powers and duties regarding contract, we've covered that, and now you're, you've moved us into the next agenda item, correct? So there's the, no action on number 10? Yeah, no, sir, there's no action. We're just doing this for, we're having class today. There you go. Uh, so anybody, anything else on the commissioner's part of it? Okay, so the judge, I, I agree with the judge mostly uh, regarding the county attorney, uh, but there's a real fine distinction here with what the county attorney's job is in, this, in a context to the commissioner's court. Uh, and I place these items on, in the order that I placed them on for a reason. Uh, again, the, the commissioner's court is an Article 5 court. And uh, 81001, which is the local government code that re deals with the commissioner's court, lays out powers and duties of the commissioner's court. And Texas Government Code 41.001 at SEEK lays out the general statute for a county attorney with his relationship to the commissioners. And I value Mr. Mills' opinion on many things. He and I talk a lot, and we discuss legal issues a lot, and I certainly value his opinion totally. But in the legal profession, there's a difference between okaying or approving a contract the way it's written as to form and approving a contract as to what the substance of the contract is. And if you read 41.001, 
of the Texas Government Code, it says a district or county attorney on request shall give to a county or precinct official of his district or county a written opinion or written advice related to the official duties of that official. Now, if you go look at the dictionary for opinion, advice, or advisory, it says counseling, suggesting, advising, but not imperative. Now, in my opinion, our county attorney's role is very important with what we do, but he's not there to tell us what to do. He's there to look at a contract if we ask him and to advise us as far as the form of that contract. As far as the substance of it, the how much it is, the terms, who's going to do what between the two parties, that's still the county commissioner's job to review the contract and make that decision. So again, if a, um, with me acting as an attorney, if someone comes into my office and says I want to do a contract between me and and uh, another party on purchasing goods or services, I will put that contract together for that person and make sure that all the clauses that are legal are in that contract, but I'm gonna give it back to the client and say, look, I've got the form of the contract here, but you gotta decide what your terms are gonna be. <coughs> so all that I'm trying to get across here in this little, uh, these modules on county commissioners versus county attorney and then the next one, or who's supposed to be doing what? And I agree with the judge, the county attorney, I value his opinion. But at the end of the day, the county attorney is not gonna be the one that votes on that particular issue or as far as the county is concerned, and he's not gonna put his signature on the document. It's gonna be the commissioners making that vote. And I don't know about the county, uh, Mr. Mills, would you come up here and explain or if I'm telling somebody something wrong here, or if I miss, uh, if I'm misconstruing something, do you are do you feel like you're on the hook for all the contracts that come through here? I think what you said is about right. You never have signed a contract. <laughs> <laughs> you never have signed a contract that right. the court's supposed to sign, have you? No. Have we asked you for a vote on a contract? Not a vote. Oh, good. No. Good. We so don't want again, now that we're on that, now that we're on the <laughs> county attorney's role, because see, we've all got lanes that we're supposed to drive in, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm just trying to make sure if there's any misunderstandings out here, and, and I'm subject to being corrected. Anybody can throw in, but I just want to make sure everybody's driving in their lane with regard to who's doing what, with regard, in this case, contracting for a big ticket item. And the county attorney's role, the judge laid it out pretty well. And, uh, but again, we're the ones that are, at the end of the day, us commissioners up here on this dais are the ones that say yes or no on it. You said big contracts. I say all contracts. I think yeah. all. I agree with that. Okay. Yeah, all contracts. I agree with that. Okay. All right. Are you ready to go to item I don't number twelve? We not. We got. We got to oh, ask a question though. You say all contracts are. You consider yeah. purchase orders being a contract? Uh, you know, as because, Lane, because you and I discussed this about certain items that you do that's in a co-op situation that the state of Texas has allowed the purchasing department to go ahead and purchase directly. Am I correct about that, that we don't have to prove, except we have overall approval when we come back in the commissioner's court, the uh, second and fourth Tuesday in commissioner's court and authorize the payment of those purchasing orders, am I right? Well, also in advance, when, when you all set the budget and you allow each department to have a budget, you, you're approving those line items in advance. You exactly. also approve it when the bill is paid. Um, but in the interim, uh, the purchasing agent uh, sets up the purchase, you know, signs the purchase order, which can be considered a contract. Uh, I mean, I even, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think even when people use the county credit card, you know, that could even be considered a contract. So there are certain cases where, I mean, I think every contract might be 
a little. Not, yeah, it's I a mean, little old. Y'all approve it before and afterwards, but I just want to make sure that uh, that I would still have the authority to sign purchase orders and such such items. That's right. It's uh, already pre-budgeted. We approve the yes, budget, sir. and then we always come back in commissioner's court, and then approve the payment yes, of sir. those orders. But it's always within a very narrow purview, like you can't. Uh, yes, I just want to make sure that I'm yeah. not not breaking oh, no. any 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 policy no. that 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 y'all are, no, are hoping to set here. Keep today. doing the good job that you're doing. Don't be bringing uh, me every contract, you, <laughs> every purchasing order that you have to sign. Uh, so you, I, I, I just, just wanted to bring you that still up. you still have the authority to buy pencils and sign RFPs. Yeah, that's you right. You bet. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Y'all just bring me those big contracts, those half a million ones. That's the ones I like to sign, like that water sewer that. Mr. Richard English like that. My sh handwriting on that's a little shaky. Okay, that brings us to item number 12. Does no action on number 11? No, sir. Just, just pure edification. Item number 12, discuss the powers and duties of the elections administrator under Texas Election Code 31.001 as related to the commissioner's court. Again, Mr. Eagle. Okay, so again, I think we had some misunderstanding a, a, a few weeks ago on uh, who's supposed to be doing what, and um, the Texas, Texas Election Code goes to the powers and duties of uh, re related to elections. For instance, and it's divided into six parts. Uh, part A is the Secretary of State. That's that person's or that office's. Uh, duties and powers related to the elections. And part B is the county elections administrator. And um, the county election, actually about half the counties in Texas have an elections administrator. The other half of the roughly, and that's roughly, it's within a half, half a dozen counties. Uh, the other counties are traditional. Traditionally, the elections were handled by two people that were elected officials. One of them was the county tax assessor collector who served as the voter registrar. And the other elected official that dealt with elections was traditionally, and still is in many counties, the county clerk. And the county clerk handled the duties and powers of running the election. And Back about 30 years ago, um, somebody came up with the idea that we should create an elections administration and transfer certain duties from the tax assessor collector uh, and the county clerk over to this office. And the creation, I will point you to 31.031, uh, the creation of the position. Part A, it says the commissioner's court, by written order, may create the position of a county elections administrator for the county. Now, I don't know if you guys knew that, but that's how it starts. And we've actually got an order on file here in this county. You can, it's, you can get it through an open records request if you'd like. It's an order that was signed in 2007 where the commissioner's court voted to go ahead and have uh, create another office in the county called the Elections Administration. Now, if you look at 31 Chapter B of, of, uh, chap of Section 31 of the Code, it goes through, you know, eligibility, the, the who's, the bond requirements, et cetera, restrictions on political activities, uh, resignation, suspension, employment, filling of vacancy, uh, the elections board, which is cr uh, created, if you create an elections administration, you also have an elections board or commission, which is comprised of five people. The county clerk, who was part of the elections originally, the tax assessor collector as one of the board members, the county chair for the Republican Party, and the county chair for the Democrat Party, and then the county judge. That makes up the election board under an elections administration. Uh, if you look at chapter or section 
there are certain duties that are that are when this election administration was created there are certain powers and duties that were divvied up so to speak and this is in context to commissioner's court just in context to the commissioner's court there are certain duties between the county clerk and the administrator that are still in the statute uh, one of them is that the um, um, elections administrator shall cooperate with the county clerk in supplying information on election matters that are be, to be brought to us or the court. Uh, there's also other classification of duties, et cetera. And then if you go to chapter or 31, the last part of, nearly the last part of subsection B, uh, section 31048A, the commissioner's court by written order may abolish the position of county elections administrator, administrator at any time. So the elections administration is a, it's kind of like, you know, when I first got elected, I got very deeply involved with the Upper Trinity Groundwater Conservation District which is a body, it's a, it's a division of the state once it got voted in, because the voters voted to have, to join the Upper Trinity Groundwater Conservation District as part of four counties. And once that happened, uh, we transferred rights and duties that the commissioners had who are elected to, and this is in relation to groundwater, to a, an unelected board that we do appoint two members on the board, but that's as close as we get to any control of it. Uh, and there's many, uh, we're, we're, we've got on the table, for instance, an ESD, an emergency services district, which is bubbling around, and I think we're gonna have a hearing on that in May, and it's another example of taking uh, powers and duties that an elected officials have, subject, who are subject to the voters, and transferring their powers and duties over to an unelected body. And so I just wanted to make sure as far as the elections administrator, uh, administrative position is concerned, because again, we had, a, we had an issue that I have been working on for about six years in this county. I was a precinct chair for the Republican Party many years, and I was, I've been to many, many, uh, many, many uh, conventions state, precinct, and county as a Republican, just like there's people out here that are members of the Democrat precincts as precinct chairs, and I certainly value their opinion as well. But one of the key issues for me is elections integrity. And so I just, feel, I just felt like this needed to get on the board because I think that something as big as the elections equipment uh, everybody needs to understand what their position is. Uh, I mean, it's a done deal now. I mean, I, I'm, I understand that. But uh, any contract like that, of that size and nature, I believe that everybody up here on this bench needs to have an opportunity to review, comment, and, and be given the time to do that. And I don't think that as an elected official, that's my job. And so uh, I'll open the, if anybody's got any questions on what the elections administrator position or office is, I'm open that up for anybody else up here. Well, uh, you know, I didn't want to interrupt you because I know you like to talk. I mean, I mean, and we like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be nasty about it, but darn it, uh, Dave, the item number 12 says, discuss the powers and duties of the elections administrator. You didn't cover that. I mean, you covered a whole bunch of stuff about it, how it's created and all that. But item number 12 says that we're supposed to discuss the duties of the election administrator under Texas Code 31001. Well, I think the uh, duties of the election administrator come under section 31.043. And we didn't really talk about that, so I didn't stop you, but really we should probably stick to the agenda item and talk about it. And I guess that's all I got to say about it. Well, well 31, uh, if, go if, ahead. If uh, Michelle would like to 
either address that or, or not. I mean, but let me say this before we get on. So y'all both talk up here. We have uh, Christina Atkins here from the Secretary of State's office and the Elections Department that has signed up there. Would you please come up here and give us what you do that about these functions here? Uh, Hey, Judge, could I, I just want to, before she begins, I want to say something uh, that Commissioner Cotton just brought out, he, and I appreciate him pointing this out, but 31043 does discuss the powers and duties of the administrator, which I did cover. I did cover it. I talked about the duties and powers of the county clerk were trans, the, her elections powers and duties, as well as the uh, the tax assessor collector's powers and duties as a voter registrar, we did talk about that. And we talked about how those two elected offices were, when the administration was created, was merged into the administration. So with that said, which in other words, I did speak about that. Go ahead, Ms. Atkins. I, I didn't know you were coming up. What a surprise. Good well, morning. Well, you know, the elections, the duties of the elections administrator is actually under Rule 81.9. Am I right? But go ahead. You're from the Secretary of State's office, and the Secretary of State has been designated by the legislature to control all the elections. Is that correct? The Secretary, the of, the Secretary of State is the Chief Election Officer for the State of Texas. Is the Election Officer for mm -hmm. the State of Texas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So tell us about the duties of our elections administrator or anybody that's been appointed by a county as the elections administrator. What are their duties? Um, well, first, let me just say good morning, Judge, and good morning, Commissioners. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for um, yeah. asking Aren't me to be here. Aren't you glad you came down from Austin? Uh, it's, it is our pleasure to, to be able to provide advice and assistance in any way that we can. So my name is Christina Adkins. I'm the legal director for the elections division. And so in, that, in my role there, uh, I work with the legal staff to provide advice and assistance to our county officials, not just the election officials, but all of our county officials with respect to the election code and the laws pertaining to elections in the state of Texas. Um, we actually had noticed that several times this week we had people that were from Hood County calling our office and contacting us. Um, so more than one person reached out to different members of our staff asking about this particular issue. And I think just to summarize, I think Commissioner Eagle was correct. He did identify uh, 31043 as being the provision that talks about the division of duties. You know, many counties opt to create the position of an elections administrator to make that position more independent. And when you create that position of an elections administrator, you take the duties of the county clerk, the duties of the tax assessor collector related to voter registration, um, and you put that in one independent office. And so that office is meant to function just as any other county department or office would. Um, so independent in the sense that they're not reporting to the county clerk or tax assessor collector, but they would still be required to follow the same processes and procedures that any other county department would with respect to interactions with commissioner's court or reviewing um, contracts, uh, you know, working with the county attorney. Um, but again, j just like I'm saying, it's, it's, it's with respect to, you know, and the way any other department would function within a county. Okay. And as part of your duties, or the Secretary of State's duties, do you review the actions of the elections administrator after an election, like our just, our general election that occurred in November? Have you reviewed what our elections administrator did, Michelle Carew? So that's a great question. So our office, and, and the way elections in Texas are structured is that, it, that it's very decentralized. Elections are decentralized. Like while, while our office might be the check, chief election officer for the state, um, many things are run on a county level, on a county by county basis. Um, to that end, I would say that we have a very, very much a cooperative relationship with our counties. We work with each other to support each other in completing our obligations under the Texas election code. So there are a number of things that the counties have to report to our office with respect to their elections, a number of reports that they have to provide. They have to provide election results, a copy of the canvas of the election. And so we work with them in that capacity. Uh, we also work with them throughout the election process when they have questions that may come up uh, with respect to election laws. You know, oftentimes we're one of the first calls they make because we, we want them to have a challenge-free election. And so the advice that we provide to them is always with that in mind. Okay. And did your office do a review, if you would, of how our elections administration performed during this last election. 
So I can say that we don't individually review each specific county office. Um, in interacting with the counties, we do get a sense if they have any major issues. Um, poll watchers that are on the ground will typically report issues to us. Um, we have inspectors that are, uh, that are participating in the election process. We send out state inspectors, and I know we did have an inspector in Hood County, and um, there were no major issues that I can recall being reported with this particular election, the, the November 2020 election in Hood County. Okay. Yes, I had seen the uh, that Miss Carew has got that um, something from Ruth R. Hughes, the Secretary of State, that sent her a letter on December the 21st of 2020 that says, "Dear Michelle, an election inspector was signed to Hood County." to observe the conduct of the November 3rd, 2020 general elections. A copy of the inspector's reports are enclosed for your review. And it reads all this deal up here and says, we appreciate the challenges you face for administering an election. We thank you for your service. And that there was no oversights or no errors or no contest at all. In fact, that she was given 100% uh, rating is that correct? That, that's correct. The inspector uh, that visited Hood County reported to us that they did not see any major issues during the course of the election. Um, it was generally a very well-run election. Okay. You know, it was our, our elections administrator was hired by our neighboring county and mm -hmm. miss right before the election. And everybody knew that this was going to be a real contested election like it turned out to be, like it still yes, is. Mm -hmm. And Miss Carew came six weeks before early voting actually began. And she was able, I think, with a bunch of great volunteers and election judges here in Hood County. We have got the best people that volunteer and do whatever is necessary. And they really stepped up in a lot of departments. Mm -hmm. I know that in Annex 1, I'm talking about Andy Ferguson's office and Michelle's office and Sandra and Melissa, everybody stepped up to really help Michelle, but they pulled together and did almost the impossible by having early voting. There was more early voting ballots this time than ever in the history of Hood County and ever in the history of the United States, I believe. But to do that and get a 100% rating, in essence, and further that, Michelle, the, the League of Women's Voters, are you familiar with that organization? Yes, sir. What is that? Um, the League of Women Voters is an organization um, that, um, it's, it's nonpartisan and historically a nonpartisan organization that does a number of things to support the elections process. They provide information on candidates. Um, they also review county websites for, uh, with respect to election security issues and have just been um, participants in the election process historically uh, for many, many years. Okay. One more question. The new voting equipment that we did by the heart, mm -hmm. see, and I think one of the reasons that I know that I voted to buy it up here was the fact that all the parts were made in the state of Texas up here. And that also that Tarrant County, our neighbor, bought $40 million worth of this voting equipment. And then part of the feature of this voting equipment is that it does the numbering of the ballots. And that I heard that the Secretary of State's office has authorized or certified that that part of the voting equipment in numbering the ballots for the differing voting precincts meet all the standards and requirements of the Secretary of State's office. Is that correct? That's correct. Can you speak to that and sure. elaborate a little Excuse bit? Excuse me, that's not only the numbering of the ballots is, is not an issue that's on the agenda today. I thought we were talking about the powers and duties of the elections administrator, and you're going right into an issue that's going to be, by the way, coming up. Well, let me say this that is the duties of the election administrator to do the balloting, isn't it not? To number the ballot? That's is correct. that the powers and duties of the election administrators? It's right on point. So well, that's a, mat that's a matter of opinion. Well, that is my opinion, 
as the chairman here, because that's exactly what you said up here, discuss the powers and duties of the election administrator under the Texas Election Code. And under the Texas Election Code, the elections administrator is the one that's charged with the numbering of the ballots. Is that correct? That's correct. That is correct, isn't it? Because I got a letter from the elections administrator in Tarrant County that says that they tried to number the ballots and that that was a nightmare prone to a lot of error where the function of the heart voting machine does that and it meets all the requirements of the Secretary of State. And that is a duty and power of the elections administrator, is it not? That's correct. Not under 31.001. <clears throat> That's under 52. Well, there's right. a bunch of different, tell me under what powers that is. I is there 81 let me read. Let me read number 12 again. Discuss. I the, read number 12, Mr. Eagle, you're out of line. We're talking about the duties and powers of the election administrator. All these people have come under up here. Texas She's election. come up here from Austin. We've got her here. It's talking about elections, duties, and powers. And I want to hear what she has to say about the elections, duties, and powers. And that's clearly what we're talking about right now. So you're going to run this with an iron fist. Is that the deal? No, no. You've been out here running it with an iron fist. I want to talk about election duties and powers of the elections administrator so that this county can work together and pull together and try to get a solution here. Everybody's up here. I'm just asking a lady that is the, what is your position again, Mr. Secretary? I'm State? the legal director for the elections You're the legal division. director. Okay, so am I correct in saying that the part of the powers and duties of part of the powers and duties of the election administrator is the numbering of ballots? That's correct. And if, if I under may, what chapter? So under 31043, sir. Under 31043, number two, county elections administrator shall perform the duties and functions placed on the county clerk by this code. And that's one of the obligations that's placed on the county clerk under the election code. So that, that duty has transferred to the county elections administrator. Commissioner Eagle, I've got a copy of that section if you need it. That's under chapter 52. No, Correct. No. Mm -hmm. This is what she's quoting there. That's right. This is what she's quoting from. I got 31043. Okay. Right. But you're, we're talking about a different issue under chapter 52. Under Chapter 52 is not an issue today. You know, the duties and powers of the election administrator is what we're here talking about today, Mr. Eagle. I'm not going to let you carve it up and come back here and waste a lot of community time. We're all here gathered. We got the Secretary of State here. She's the one that can answer questions for us directly. Now, I know you may want to come back and talk about whether or not she has the power to number the ballots, but it's a power when I read all of this that the elections administrator clearly has. Am I right, Mrs. Atkins? That's correct. So okay. let, me, let me ask you then. Would you mind reading Texas Election Code 52.062? Numbering of ballots. The ballots prepared by each authority responsible for having the official ballot prepared shall be numbered consecutively beginning with the number one. Now, has the Secretary of State purported to suspend that? No, we, we do not suspend or waive any laws. And that's because under Article 1 of the Texas Constitution, Section 28, it specifically states that no power of suspending laws in this state shall be exercised except by the legislature. Correct? That's correct, sir. Our, our, our office does not waive or suspend any laws. Okay. All I got on that one. Good. Now we got that clear that, and, and am I correct again that the hard equipment that this commissioner's court just purchased, the procedure in that election on the voting equipment, their procedure for numbering the ballots has been approved and certified by the Secretary of State. That's correct. Okay. In, in fact, Good. I would say we worked with them when, when Hart presented this software to, to us um, in discussions about the ballot numbering issue, we helped them develop 
uh, a, a software-based way of providing that ballot numbering requirement. So they did work closely with our office to ensure compliance of state law. So, but you understand the dichotomy that sets up, correct? With, but the, it flies in the face of 52062, doesn't it? No, sir, I disagree with you on that. 52075 talks about modification of a ballot form for certain voting systems. Our office has the authority to prescribe the form and content of a ballot in certain elections using certain types of voting systems. And the reason why is because the election code as it's written is largely based on traditional paper-based uh, methods of, of voting. For example, um, a voter-marked paper ballot that's hand-tallied. Uh, that's how the election code was written. And then since the election code was written, there have been a number of provisions added to the election code acknowledging and carving out a way to provide for electronic voting systems. And, and we use electronic voting systems for accessibility purposes and for accuracy and security purposes. And so instead of modifying every provision in the Texas election code to add in provisions related to um, these different types of electronic systems that are out there, there are other certain provisions scattered throughout the code that prescribe uh, certain authority to our office to, um, you know, modify procedures related to the electronic voting systems to ensure their compliance with state law. And actually, we in this county right here, uh, we've we've been using election equipment for the last 15 years that had no uh, paper ballot what's back up at all, didn't we? That's correct. Yes. And so what's what I what what is happening? And this is not just in Texas. Uh, this is going on in many states is that there's more and more jurisdictions and voters and people who are politically active going, wait a minute, we need to go back to some traceability. We need to go back to potentially paper ballots. We need to go back to precinct politics. There's a lot of discussion out there, correct? About Absolutely, yes. And so, mm -hmm. and I think that I would like to have this discussion in depth because I still, I'm having trouble understanding how you can admit that uh, 52.062 has not been suspended by the Secretary of State, but you go point to somewhere else. Do you have any AG opinions or any opinions out there that basically say 52.062 has no meaning? Um, nothing that would say that it has no meaning because we believe it does have meaning under the law. But this issue on ballot numbering has been something that's been heavily litigated over the years. And I would be happy to provide you with some information. I can show you some cases that address the ballot numbering issue and I can show you kind of the evolution of the law in this particular area because of the introduction of electronic voting systems. But I'm happy to provide you with that research. Yeah, because that's that's mm -hmm. a very hot topic right now. Yes. Uh, you know, because we all, it's been heavily litigated. Every ballot, one right? of us, whether we're right wing, left wing, in the middle, uh, whatever the party affiliation, we all want a fair, honest election that everybody can look at and say, one vote, one person. And that my vote counted and I didn't get negated by three not legal votes, let's say. So we're, I think we're all after the same thing, but there is a, there is a debate right now between pre-numbered ballots, starting with the number one, based on the statute versus having the equipment randomly numbered in the computer. And I, I don't have a, basically even myself, I don't have my hands fully around both sides of that yet. But I think it's a relevant discussion, absolutely. don't you? Well, absolutely. You know, it's, it's a matter of security and voter confidence and you want to do the thing that's going to make people feel confident in the election process. Um, but I can tell you because of all the litigation on this issue, we take this very seriously. Um, and first of all, let me just commend you all first for moving to a paper-based system. I think that that was the right decision going forward in the climate that we're in because it's an auditable system. So um, I, I do commend you all for taking that, that step to, to acquire this system that I think is um, going to provide more voter confidence. But because of that heavy litigation on ballot numbering issue, we take it very seriously and um, went through a, a number of discussions with all of our vendors on how to meet these numbering requirements in a way that was compliant with state law, but also um, was not going to uh, produce excessive costs for wasting paper and wasting um, ballot stock uh, because it can be very expensive and we know that you know cost savings is an important part of the election process as well not not at the uh, to the extent that it sacrifices security in the election process but those are things that all of our local counties have to be aware of because you all are the ones that are funding the election um, and so that's why we have a number of different ways that you can meet these ballot numbering requirements with the new electronic technology that's out there uh, so that so that you know 
you can decide what's best, you know, as a county, you all can decide what's best for the voters in your community. So, and, and just to tag, I mean, I agree mm -hmm. with what you're saying, and just to tag along with that, let's just talk about the primary, for instance. The parties run their primaries, correct? They run election day, that's correct. Uh -huh. and, and if the, if, if the for instance, just, let's just say the Republican Party mm -hmm. or the Democrat Party, it doesn't make any difference. One or both of the parties demands that they have pre-numbered, sequentially numbered ballots starting with a number one. That has to be done, correct? Well, that's an interesting question um, because while the parties are responsible for all of the election day procedures related to the election, it's the county that runs early voting. Um, and it's the county that's typically renting and leasing the equipment to the parties. And so that's something that they're going to have to discuss uh, together to come to a resolution on. And the, and the cost overrun, I, I, I'm aware of that. And I think in a county like Tarrant, for instance, where you've got hundreds of thousands of voters, if you've got a, if you wanted to go to a pre-numbered, sequentially numbered ballot system, you're going to have to order a lot more overage, and That's that correct. does become a significant expense potentially. Mm -hmm. And I've been quoted 12, 14 cents a piece mm -hmm. for the ballots. In a county like our county, which you have roughly potentially 35,000 voters, you know, your overage, it, and I'm just saying hypothetically, uh, if we went, if the county went at least in the primary to pre numbered, sequentially numbered, starting with the number one ballots, the overage that would be required could potentially be three or four thousand ballots, which you're talking about less than a thousand dollars. So it's relative to, yeah. as to who, which jurisdiction we're talking about as to how big of an issue that is. Would you agree with that? Sure, but I, but I would also say that $1,000, depending on the county budget, could be quite a lot of money for an entity that's having an election. But, but so that's, that, up that's up to that's the county. To. That, mm -hmm. that would be up to the county. And it, actually, mm -hmm. in, the, in the context of a, of a primary, that would be up to the party. Correct. And um, like I said, to the extent that they're contracting with the county, but, but may I also remind you too that there are rules in place with respect to contracting um, and what kinds of costs the state will reimburse for with respect to contracting. And so they do have to work with their county elections officer um, because there are some cost savings purpose or reasons for needing to do so. I'm aware of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. But just to get this straight, since we purchased the heart equipment that does the paper balloting, that does the numbering, that procedure has been certified by the Secretary of State's office as being acceptable and meeting all standards. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. I believe it's so, even specifically referenced in the certification order we issued for, the, for the, that particular version of the, the heart so system. So why would you not use what has already been certified by the Secretary of the State's office in the voting equipment? Is it, I mean, that's a local question, sir. Uh, you know, that's why we've authorized several different ways of doing it, so that the elections administrator or the county clerk, whoever's responsible for elections in that county, can decide what's best for the county. And is issue. it the elections administrator's decision as to whether to use the automatic balloting numbering in the heart? Is that her duty, or is it the duty of the commissioner's court to decide which? I would say that by law, it's the authority of the person responsible for preparing the ballot, and that would fall on your county election officer, be that an elections administrator in your county or in other counties, it would be usually okay. a county clerk. So That's whoever's responsible for preparing it would make those decisions. Okay, good. All right, thank you very much for I, your help. That could I ask one important. more question? Of course. Yeah, who asked you to come up here? Could I, may I ask? Um, yes, uh, Michelle Carew, your elections administrator, gave me a call and indicated that there was some interest from the commissioner's court that I be present for. Thank you for today. Okay. And we've we've Come spoken on the phone, right? We have, yes, sir. Thank mm -hmm. you. And I've okay. sent you an email some, and some. Yes, sir. And we've corresponded, so yes, sir, we, we kind of know each other. So it's we good do. to meet you. Yes, it's nice to meet you too. Good. I'm glad y'all get along, so y'all can <laughs> trust each other. That's perfect. Okay, Mr. Peters, you you signed up to speak on this item also. Yes, I did. Thank you again. <clears throat> Ms. Atkins. Oh, buddy. All right. You said lanes a lot. Let's talk about some lanes that you've been in, Commissioner Eagle. You went to the Library Advisory Board and you cared about how they were run, or you didn't. You came down here and dressed down not one, not two, but three head librarians. You drove out our last elections administrator. And you have these strange opinions about law now that have been litigated, like the county clerk's opinion on whether or not we should issue marriage licenses 
to same-sex couples. Have you got an issue can with I finish, voting equipment? Can I finish, sir? I came up here for five minutes. Well, I, I you interrupted her, I don't know, half a dozen times. I'd appreciate hey, hey, it no. if the judge would get this in Are order. You, I'm giving you a little preamble like we do in court here a little bit, but, you know, the topic is the powers and duties of the elections administrator. Sir. Fair enough. You believe your... Let me, let me make it very specific. I do not want to see you drive another elections administrator from this county by harassment, by attempting to impose your will and your particular peculiar interpretation of the law on them. You've done it multiple times now to multiple civil servants in this county. You have literally driven people from this county, Commissioner Eagle. You rode into power, into that seat, what is it, seven years ago, six years ago now, coming up, going after the library and censorship. You threatened to defund parts of the library. You threatened to shrink the court. You have all kind of political Mr. and legal opinions. Mr. Peters, the, the topic is the elections administrators. You don't have to get back to the topic, okay? Uh, this, is, this is, I, my point right here <laughs> is that by trying to specifically use three different bullet points on today, we've got 10, 11, 12, discuss the power, nothing even to do. Discuss the powers and duties of a county commissioner and commissioner's court under Texas Constitution Article V, so on, 11. Discuss the powers and duties of the county attorney. This is because you want to install someone in that position. You failed last time. You try to install a, a lackey for a West Texas oil baron, and you failed at it. And now you're going to try and harass this person until they leave. Now, you want to say it's about control of contract and duties, and you dress it up in this language. Well, this county kind of does what it wants to do a lot of the time, and then it goes to the courts. That's how it works in this society. Sometimes I've supported that. I supported the previous commissioner in my district, and I supported Roger Deeds saying you don't have to work with the FBI to confiscate guns, because I believe that. And for the record, I actually support paper ballots and have done it since Diebold was stealing elections in the aughts. It mattered to me 15, 16 years ago. I was marching in the streets about it then. I care very much about election security. As I'm sure you're aware, I study software security. I practice binary analysis. And I know how useless these machines are. I hate them. I'm very glad to see paper ballots in this county. And like the, the person from the state, I commend you all for introducing paper ballots here. That's very important. But I'm tired of this. I'm tired of it. And a lot of other people are too. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Nathan Criswell, you signed up to address number 12. <clears throat> Good morning, Judge and Commissioners. Hope everyone's having a nice, very relaxed, easy morning. It's good to see everybody getting along th today. Now, I know that election security, especially after 2020, has been a huge deal. And one of the underlying problems is that elected officials have been delegating the authority granted to them to appointed officials. These appointed officials then start manipulating the rules, uh, as uh, I believe, the Secretary of State's office has done. What Dave Eagle, Commissioner Eagle cited was numbered ballots starting with one. This heart system has the potential to do that, but I don't know that our current elections administrator wants that function carried out. Now, I believe that that's something that makes it to be very easy to audit, and I believe it's something that would help restore a little faith in our election system. We've seen how the courts in Georgia Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan can interpret things and start saying, oh, this person can change the rules at the last minute, this person can change the rules at the last minute. We need to get back to the core of what the statutes and what the law says and get away from these obscure opinions by oftentimes hyper-liberal judges and appointed officials. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more. Uh, Dr. Harold Granick, number, item number 12. Well, I'd hope to 
rest on my laurels here. I noticed the service dog behind me has fallen asleep with the exposition of uh, this discussion. Uh, I may be the only person here who's been li living, who's been a uh, Republican Precinct 8 chairman and a uh, Democratic Precinct 8 chairman. Uh, I, I'm an election judge and a retired, I guess, uh, uh, deputy uh, registrar. Uh, I just want to say that Michelle Carew has done a wonderful job. People may disagree with the results of an election, but the elections have been done very fairly. I'll quote uh, uh, past uh, commis uh, uh, Judge Cockrum when this issue was discussed in election meeting as he was exiting and said, there's an hour of his time that will never be recovered. Uh, I think the elections have been extremely fair. Uh, Michelle has done a wonderful job, and I hope she continues to do that. People may dispute the results of an election. That's not the same as the election uh, is not properly done, either at a county level, at a state level, or a national level. Thank you. Okay. Now. I'm assuming that this is no motion. This is just another discussion. Am I correct, that's, Mr. Eagle? That's correct. Just okay. Wanted to wanted to get it out on the table and hear everyone's valid opinions. And about I, can I ask one question? Um, you had mentioned that this has been litigated several different ways. Are there any uh, opinions come down on the electronic? Has that been challenged for electronically numbering the ballots as opposed to buying pre-numbered, pre-printed ballots? So historically, this issue has come up in the context of DRE voting machines or the direct recording electronic, the paperless ones that, that you all were previously using. Mm -hmm. um, that's the context in which it came up about, about ballot numbering. And uh, I think the bottom line on this is that with respect to certain types of election technology, um, these devices all have what's called a public counter. And what the courts have said is that that public counter, where it tracks the number of voters on each, that have used each device, uh, meets the ballot numbering requirements. And so that's kind of the broad answer there. Um, but like I said, there's been a number of cases that kind of lead up to this and spell that out. Um, in addition to that, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share any other any specific research that we have. But but that's broadly where the issue came from. And so the devices or the the system that you all are uh, purchased, um, both both Heart and ESNS, these ballot marking devices and and the subsequent precinct scanners where the ballots are scanned all have public counters, but in addition to that, they have the ability to comply with the ballot numbering requirement um, by affixing a number to the paper ballot itself. Okay. Well, I mean, I can. I th there's no hotter topic uh, nationwide right now than than the integrity of the elections. I think that that's a, a a major issue right now. And and frankly, it seems to me that a pre-numbered ballot could be significantly more secure. I, I haven't spent a great deal of time researching this. I'm, I'm kind of shooting from the cuff. I think M Michelle and I have talked about this about that much also. Sure. And, uh, you know, I, 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 it seems reasonable to me that this is something that we could and should be looking at to, to properly secure our elections. And I'm not saying that our elections have been uh, in, in any way out of line. I'm just saying that this is an additional security that that's something that we could be looking at that I think would give the, the voter more confidence in our system that quite frankly, the conf our confidence in our system is broken right now. And I think that a, a little remedy to that would, would go a long way. So that's, I hear what you're saying. I think that voter confidence is an extremely important thing right now um, because our elections are in Texas, I can speak to Texas, I can't speak to the rest of the country, but, but elections in Texas are very safe and secure. Um, our, our elections administrators, our county clerks, our local election officials do a very good job um, managing the election within their, within their counties. With the ballot numbering issue, one thing that I'd like to point out is, you know, we, as I said, we worked with both vendors, so both vendors offer a software-based solution on ballot numbering to come up with a way where they are complying with state law, so it, it essentially, I'm going to give you the big pic picture explanation, mm -hmm. there's a range of numbers assigned to each location, and so it generates a random number within that range, so ballot number one could be, you know, 
something that's assigned to a particular person. And it also tracks that particular number. So at the end of the day, you can print out a report of every ballot number that was printed at a given location so that you could go through, if you, wanted, if you thought that somebody was printing out ballots in one location and going to another location to you know, try to vote that ballot somewhere else, you would know if that ballot didn't come from that particular uh, ballot marking device or that location because you could look at the numbers, you could go through and look at each of those numbers and you could say which numbers came from one location and which numbers came from another. So that's the purpose of the ballot number requirement is really for tracking purposes. So you know where your ballot stock is, you know what was assigned to what location, and you know what ballots were voted at each location. So being able to generate a report that gives you the list of numbers essentially provides the same assurances that only, you know, 10 ballots were voted at precinct A versus 20 ballots at precinct B. It's just another way of tracking it. Um, and, and I would argue that in, in some ways it's more accurate and more secure because there's less of an, there's less of an ability for people to, you know, shift paper around from location to location or shift ballot styles from location to location. Can I throw something in? I just want to hear and I just want to make sure I understand is right now we're kind of moving into this hybrid world where you know we've got the electronic side of an election but we've got a we got this either whether it's pre-numbered or you got a stack sure. of blank ballots and they run mm -hmm. through it numbers them randomly uh, there's not any case the case there's no case law that's developed out of this on yet this right particular, um, on, on this particular uh, configuration no huh? okay that's mm -mm. I, th I just want to make sure I got the answer to that. I think that was my original question to <laughs> start off with, so yeah, okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Okay. <coughs> Ms. Sharon Sealander, item number 12. I didn't realize the Secretary of State uh, official was going to be here today. There's something that I have wondered about and have trying to decide what to do about it, and I've talked to several people. So when our elections were over November 3rd, and that I received a listing of all the voters in Hood County, um, and at the bottom of that there was a summary at the bottom, and in that summary it listed how many people were voted, and then in the other column, how many voted early voting, how many voted um, by mail-in ballot, and how many voted on election day. And when you tally those across, there were six precincts in those out of our 16 that had an extra vote that didn't tally with the number of voters. So brought a question to me as to why would these precincts have one more vote then they'd have voters. So I addressed it with Michelle, and Michelle said, well, she had talked to ESNS, and they had said that the guy that did the summary or whatever had forgot to remove some of the provincial votes out of the tally, which seems strange to me that each one of these only had one, when I know that um, Precinct 7, which I am the judge in, had three. You know, why would they erase two and not one? You know, I mean, all of them and not have any because Precinct um, 7 didn't have any provisionals or any extra votes. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so it just came into question to me, why would we have an extra vote that we didn't have a voter for? And why would the ENS erase some of the provincials but not all of the provincials? So I just think it's kind of something to look into, maybe investigate. Why? Because I know that local elections sometimes are, um, you know, the person wins by less than 10 votes sometimes. So six votes can make a big difference. So just something that's been on my mind. And since we have all of this audience we have today, I thought I'll bring that up to you guys. Ask, do you have an answer, I asked Ms. Ms. Atkin? I asked Michelle. Oh. Well, yeah. Oh, you mean the yes. Secretary of State? I can answer that question. Okay. So on election night, we had a representative here from ESNS, which was Chris Moody, the gentleman that came on whenever we were talking about buying equipment. And when he printed out the report, he included provisional ballots, the column that should not have been on that election night reporting, because we don't even tally that until days later. 
when our ballot board comes in, which is before we do the canvassing. So that's why those numbers did not add up. When it was brought to my attention, I called him and he said it was just an issue of him check marking for it to be there. Now, I don't have a breakdown how many provisionals were by, you know, per precinct right here in front of me, so I can't explain why. Maybe it was just weird that there was one per precinct, but that particular column wasn't supposed to be released that night and that was just oversight. Okay. I spoke with my Democrat judge out in Lipan and that and uh, she also confirmed there were at least three conventional ballots, conventional ballots in um, precinct seven. So I know that for a fact. I know several other judges told me they had multiple. And with the size of election we had, there had to be probably many provisional ba ballots that were done. It's just strange to me that only one was reported in each of the six precincts and not all precincts. It just seemed kind of out of order to me. I just thought it's something I needed to bring to the court. Maybe they should look into it and find out why, how that happened. So. Okay. What, you know? Do you have any response? Do you have a response, Ms. Atkins, to what they just said about this? Well, I can't speak to the specifics of what happened in Hood County because I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, I, I haven't right. reviewed the right. results itself. Um, but if we're talking about provisionals, a good number of provisional ballots, uh, you know, you get provisionals that come in during early voting, provisionals that come in on election right. day, and most of those provisional ballots from election day don't typically get reviewed until after the fact. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's it's not unusual to see those numbers change, your final results change from election mm -hmm. day to the time that you canvass because you've added in provisional ballots at that time. But the total count of votes was added. The one vote was added into the total votes for the, that precinct. So the total vote for the precinct had that one extra vote in it. Was it total votes or total number of people voted? No, it was total votes. We included in there in the column of people that voted provisional and voted. Um, I had never worked with that program before, so I don't know if that was included in the column of people that voted. So being a judge, I'll go ahead while they're talking. I'll go ahead and say that once we finished election day or the elections that day and that you have a poll book and you have a printout from all of the machines and as judges you make sure that those numbers match and if they don't when we bring our information our stuff back to the uh, control room then we have to let them know and that has to be signed off on so I don't know if Michelle has reasonings why you know we had this one extra vote counted that possibly shouldn't have been counted so do you have anything to add to that? I mean, that was on the election night report, not on the actual final report. So, whenever the election night results went out that night, that's when the provisional, the number of provisionals were included in that column that shouldn't have been there to begin with. And so, in the final, once they were counted, we went back into the system, and those that were counted by the ballot board were put into the system, and those that were not counted were left off. Now, of course, that was in November. I don't have the reports in front of me. My mind is not exactly on that to be able to give you the information on that, to tell you which ones were counted and which ones weren't. But, I mean, we've maintained all of our records. Anyone's welcome to come look and see at our provisionals. On the back, there's notes by the ballot board as to why or they were or were not accepted. Um, as far as that goes, that extra number that was in there was brought to my attention that exact same night, and it was corrected and then uploaded. Okay, Ms. Atkins, can you address what Ms. Carugia said? Does that happen? I mean, is that? Yeah, the, is I mean, the procedure that she outlined it, with with respect to how those numbers get added up, um, I mean, that's correct. You know, again, without looking at the report or knowing more details about it, it's hard to determine, you know, what the, what the issue was exactly. But I will say, if you had Chris Moody here, um, I mean, he's the top person for ESNS in the state of Texas, so I'm pretty confident that if there had been an issue, you know, he would have addressed that issue. That's the guy who gave the report, wasn't it, Chris Moody, mm -hmm. that reviewed all the records and certified that everything was done correctly? Have you seen that report, Ms. Sheehan? No, so that's why I'm bringing it to court. Maybe we can get a, a reason, somebody to investigate or whatever exactly what happened that night. Did we actually have a additional vote in these precincts? And, that, and um, it was... Again, I want to just say, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist or whatever, but it was like, my, and the reason I know this is because I'm precinct 10 where I vote, and my precinct had an extra vote. So when I looked at that and I saw that, I'm like, hmm. So I started looking. Well, 11 didn't. They were balanced. 12 did. 
13 didn't, 14 did, 15 didn't, 16 did. So it's strange to me that we just had this alternating number of just one extra vote in these precincts, and it just raised concern to me of how that happened. So I just think it should be looked into and investigated, some reports. Well, we can give changed. it to Mr. Moody. Is that who we would send it to? Is that what you recommend? Also, I'd like to um, remind the court on election night, the inspector was also in our room where we tally the votes. And had there been any type of misdoing, she would have reported it to you on that report that was submitted to the Secretary of State's office. OK. And I, let's, send it to, let's just send it to Mr. Moody then. Let him look at it. Right. He's looked at it once. And just point out the six mm -hmm. votes mm -hmm. out of the entire county. Yes, the 16 precincts. OK. If I could tie this up, Judge, or tie it a little knot, I just want to say this, based on what I've seen today. Uh, these, these three agenda items, I think it's, for what I've seen here is we all want an open, honest, and fair election. We may have different ideas of how to get there, but I think at the end of the day, what I've heard from this podium is that everybody wants that. And so... I think it's good that we had this conversation, and there was times of a little bit of uncomfortableness with it, but I think people out here can understand that this last election has a lot of people feeling like there were things that didn't happen correctly. We want to make sure it doesn't happen here. Um, with that said, I've never said that it has any discrepancy or anything in the past has happened. We've had good elections here as far as I know. And we're talking about the future. So I want to let everybody know I appreciate their input, whether you, you don't like what I did four or five years ago or whatever, you know, that's fine. But, uh, but it's good to hear everybody get this passionate. And it is a passionate issue about our election process because we want it to be fair, straight, and honest. I have one last yeah. word. I'll take the last no, word. No, can on I it. have one first? Go ahead. You, right. I'll go. So I'm going to have the last yeah, one. All I'm right. going to change the subject just a little bit, but I want to uh, kind of, I guess, give you a kudo and kind of put you in place too, Judge. We've got rules, and procedures, and contacts and decorum of meetings at the Hood County Commissioner's Court, and where it says that the public uh, uh, has to complete a public participation form and submits same to the county clerk prior to the time of the agenda item. And you've been very laxed, and I know there's at least a couple, I won't name their names, after we got into the agenda, and you're going against policy, and, and I commend you for that, because this is such a hot topic, but I wanted you guys all to know, that's what the judge is trying to do. So I think he gets picked on sometimes because he tries to run the court and try to get through so you people don't have to be here for three or four hours, however, you know, we set these rules for ourselves, and then we don't abide by them. So uh, I commend you, but, you know, we really need to either change the rules. If you want to have open discussion, court, that's the five of us, not just the judge. We change the rules to allow that to happen, but we're violating our own rules. So that's I, all I've got to say. I appreciate that, and I think that that's what we will do. It says prior to the deal, so if you don't have your public participation form prior to tall at 12. But I thought since we had the Secretary of State down here, we had people down here, now was a good time to go ahead and do it. We can enlarge upon the time at certain times, but I would rather adhere to rules on here, like what we've got on the thing, the five minute situation here. We've got to have rules in order for this to proceed in an orderly fashion. So. I want to just say one thing about this election. This election here in Hood County turned out exactly how I anticipated it would turn out. I mean, the conservative vote here in Hood County is what everybody kind of had predict predicted. It's over 84% of the elected voters came back and reported uh, uh, Republican. So it's what I anticipated, and everybody that has come up to me, Republican chairman, Democratic chairman, has told me, and, and the people that's on the elections board, said that it was a very fair, open, honest election, which every vote counted. 
I agree with Mr. Uh, Commissioner Eagle here, is that everybody is entitled to a vote, and they are entitled to their vote being counted, and that's what we ensured, that's what we have got to do. So with that, let's move on to number 13, please. Discuss and take appropriate action to edit Hood County, Texas Handbook Policies and Procedure Manual to align with the Texas Penal Code sections 46.03 and 46.035. Commissioner uh, Wilson and Commissioner Eagle. You want to take off with her or you want me to? Paul. Okay. Uh, so this particular item, uh, it's just a tweak for our uh, employee policy. Uh, we've got a current policy that, that basically we got two places in the policy that talks about uh, possession of firearms on the on county property and all we're going to be doing is adding uh, the uh, the we got two codes that go to improper or illegal possession and that's texas penal code 4603 that has to do with a court or an office utilized by the court or 46035 that has to do with uh, 30 out 6, 30 out 7 restrictions. All we're doing is adding to our employee handbook that if you fall within those parts of the penal code that you're, it's legal for you to carry. Is, does that sound about right? That's it. That's, that's the short of it. Basically what we're allowing, because we have situations in the county where employees that receive and take monies at different locations, I can name at least three immediately, where they are not allowed and there is no law enforcement protection there while they are doing their duties. And that includes the tag office being open on a Saturday each month. This is for the benefit of the employees and plus it's restricting by not doing this, we're restricting their rights in accordance with state statute 4603 and 46035 to be able to do that when John Doe coming in to those offices can carry, if he has, that individual has an LTC, and then the employees cannot. Therefore, that puts the liability on the county, bottom line. If the employees have an LTC and so choose, my opinion is they should be allowed to exercise that right in accordance with 4603 and 46035. That's it. So Andy, you can bring your hog leg up here now. Okay, and the sheriff, you don't have any problem with that either. I know you and I discussed that as well is that if you have your license to carry, that, uh, that, that would apply everywhere except for the courtrooms here and the courthouse. Uh, yeah, the offices court, used by the court. The yeah. courthouse and the courtrooms are subject to the office of, um, what is it called, OCA? Is that right? Correct, and that it, judge that presides over that office. Yeah, so. That, yeah, I'm good with all of this. Just make sure that the uh, judges know that, like this building and any any building that has a courtroom in it and a judge, then um, falls under a little different category. But yeah, otherwise, I'm fine with all this. Okay, we had a meeting this morning among Judge Walton, Judge Messina, and I about uh, the COVID restrictions here and about the signs on other buildings, which is on coming up, but uh, but that's right, but the court houses and the court rooms are subject to the purview of the district judge and county judge to decide what the rules are in their courtroom, is that correct? And the courthouse here, right? Correct. Okay. So, me, will signs be placed on the buildings or the rooms where weapons are not allowed? That's probably going to be a good idea. I mean, we were the, what do you, you know, in accord with well, state statute, the only way to prohibit that is 46, I mean, putting up 30 out 6 and 30 out 7 signs, which are in the JP doors and in, you know, other, you know, certain other buildings. But without 30 out 6 and 30 out 7 sign up, 
you know, that makes it illegal for, makes it legal for LTC holders, whether they're in county employees or not, to enter those premise unless it's an office utilized by the court, at, you know, the court itself. So those okay. signs will not be placed there. This doesn't change signage at all. This is just regurgitating the statute, the penal code. Doesn't change any signage that... The courtrooms are already posted. They're already... Yeah. They're already posted. Yeah. Okay. Where, they're, where they need to be posted, they're already posted. That is correct. Are all already posted where they should be? Yes. Through the drive counts. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, good. Do I hear a motion? I so move that we take the appropriate action to edit the Hood County, Texas Handbook of Policies and Procedures Manual to align with Texas Penal Code Sections 46.03 and 46.035. And I'll second that. Okay. Wilson says I made a motion to take appropriate action to edit the Hood County, Texas Handbook Policies and Procedures Manual to align with the Texas Penal Code Sections 46.03 and 46.035, second by Commissioner Eagle. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries five to zero. <laughs> okay, bring us to number 14, discuss and take appropriate action to allow removal of all COVID-19 related signage currently on display in public areas on county property to be effective March 10, 2021. Commissioner Eagle. Uh, I just want, I, I think Judge, you've already You've already kind of preempted this with your order that you put in last week, but this is just basically allowing those public spaces that are, that's the county uh, property where we have signs that you must wear a mask, et cetera, to let you take them down uh, in, in whatever areas. Now, we, we don't have authority over the, the anything related to the courts. That's uh, Supreme Court rules to have, deals with that. But any place where it's just strictly county property, uh, you, you, can you think of anything else, Mr. Mills, as far as taking down the signs in just county public space where I just want to see these signs never again in my li in the rest of my life? Right. So, yeah, just the, the public, the, the outer doors, the, I guess the outer doors and then like in the hallways here where it says uh, six feet distance and stuff, I guess that's what you're getting at. Right. And it allow. I guess if some particular office, well, I don't want to go there. I just... Well, the courts are going to do what they, the courts have a different set of marching orders, so we can't tell them what to do. Well, right. I'll give you what's over at the annex, annex one on the door. That sign says coronavirus COVID-19. Help us limit the spread of COVID-19. Is everybody in favor of that? Let's not spread COVID-19. Uh, and it says, uh, if you have any of these following symptoms, uh, don't come in. Fever, cough, shortness of breath, body aches, and sore throat. Is that bad that we should say if you've got that stuff, you really don't want to be coming into our county offices? I'm just asking. Uh, temperature may be checked upon entering. That's what this sign says. Now, while in the building, we encourage social distancing. We're not telling you you can't. You can do what you want, but we're encouraging it. Stay, feet, stay, stay six feet apart. Thank you. That's all the sign says. Now, if we take that down, are we indicating that we got no problem in the county? We're okay. There's no more of a COVID uh, pandemic. That's not what our county health authority says. It says we do. But all I'm saying is these signs, we're not restricting anybody to come into our office uh, on Annex 1. That saying doesn't say must, can't, but it encourages you if you've got a fever, a cough, you've got potentially COVID, we'd rather you didn't come in. Uh, is that a bad thing? Should, should we take that down and, and, and put a message, uh, insinuate that things are okay and if you've got a fever and cough, don't worry about it. Just come on over and give me a hug. Uh, I'm being a little bit, you know, over the top, but the, the sign when we say, the other thing is that the, uh, <laughs> the agenda item says we'll allow. Well, who's going to do it? Let's talk about Annex 1. There's two commissioners in that court. They're in that building and I think control Annex 1. And what if I want to take the sign down and he doesn't? Who controls that? Remember, it says allow. You're going to allow us to take it down. Well, who's going to do it? Uh, I might not want to because it's not restricting anybody. So I don't have any problem with what you've got, Dave, on the agenda that I agree 
because of the GA order coming down, but you know, there's issues with the court and, and still our county health authority, Mr. Blocker, still says we're in a pandemic and we're subject to COVID-19. So as a recommendation, myself, I would, I would not want to encourage people to forget about COVID-19 because I think it's still out there. So uh, that's all I've got to say about it. Anybody else? Well, I, I just, and I, I, I hear your comments and uh, you know, that's, you're certainly, I understand your position. And of course, we've all got different opinions about this. And you know, I, I remember one of the, I did a lot of products liability work when I was practicing full time down in San Antonio. And there's a place up north of downtown where there's, a, it's a, just one spot, but it's real interesting. I always laughed if I had to go up there because the road's going, getting ready to go across a railroad crossing, it's up here. And there's a light right there too. And the, there's a sign on it that said, don't park on the railroad tracks. And I always laughed about that because I thought, well, do you have to have a sign, you know, to say don't park on the railroad tracks and when you're in a blind corner? Maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, you know, so I'm kind of, I, I, you know, I understand Commissioner Cotton's concerns and I, you know, I think there's a point of personal responsibility here maybe and uh, anyway, that's just my comment. If I'm sick, I'm gonna stay home. I don't need a sign to tell me to do that. And I think that at this point in time, we've had this drilled into our head for the last year or something. I'm in favor of taking these dang signs down. <clears throat> I'll beat you over there because I can run faster than you. <laughs> Good arm wrestle. No, you beat me at that, you're too young. Well, do I hear a motion? Yeah, Judge, I'll make the motion uh, per the agenda item as worded to allow removal of all COVID-19 related sign signage currently on display in public areas on county property to be effective tomorrow. Um, Excluding courthouses and courtrooms. Excluding wherever the Supreme Court, you know, That's okay. we're not going to tell him what to do. And we're not going to tell Commissioner Cotton what to do. He can <laughs> do what he wants. I'll second it. A okay, motion been made and second to take appropriate action to allow removal of, over, of all COVID-19 related signage currently on display in public areas on county property with the exception of courthouses and courtrooms since they are under the purview of the Supreme Court of Texas and not the governor. Second by Commissioner Andrews. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. All right, the motion carries four to one. <clears throat> okay, item number 15, discuss and possible Rem approval for new animal control water heater and water softener due to leak on current water heater. Mr. J. Riley, another hero judge, in the ice storm. He and his people, I want you to say this, worked a lot of hours when a lot of plumbers. other county employees were off. I know that. Because we were plumbers. Right? <laughs> plumbers. <laughs> he had the foresight to go up to Home Depot and every place else to uh, yeah. to buy every elbow and yeah. So PVC anybody that wasn't and, able to find anything, it's yeah. probably our fault. Yeah. So <laughs> they're you did, an, now. They're, you they did got an a excellent lot of job, now. and I'm going to thank you and your men for doing that, and also but they what did you did for the Sons job. of the Republic and putting out all the chairs and putting up the cones and things yeah. of that yeah. nature. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ron yeah. Sutton gave you a. A big kudos for helping well, I appreciate all that stuff. That. So thank you. Um, what I got, and I didn't actually plan for this in my budget this year, so this kind of took me by surprise. Out of animal control, we've got a 125 gallon hot water heater out there. And what it is, is they wash a lot of the bedding, a lot of the stuff for the dogs on a daily basis. This water heater is electric. It, it's large, um, it puts out a lot of hot water. So what happened, we noticed about a year ago we'd get calcium buildup on all of the elements. So we'd pull them out, I bought an extra set, 
and we just swap them out once a month. Well, that worked for a while, and then the, uh, and a lot of that's due to the calcium in the water. So what happened was we did that for about the last year and been trying to find a way to get around it, and then the water heater itself started eroding, starting to leak. Um, it's probably on its last leg, but it's still working today. But what I did, I got a quote for a new one. It's the same thing that's in there. We're, we're limited to electricity due to the fact we No don't, gas? No gas. So a new one, um, well, and then I said, well, what's the problem? Let's fix the problem instead of changing out the water heater. So we're looking at putting in a water softener. Water softener is going to soften the water, take the calcium out of it, and hopefully it's kind of an experiment for me at best. They're telling me it'll work, it'll save those elements, but I'm also, if this does work, I would also look at one later on down the road for the jail for some issues I'm having up there. So the price that I got for y'all today in total price with the water softener is $26,291. The softener itself is $2,850. That's not too bad for a large commercial uh, softener. What's the total? Fifty is included in the, the total. Thousand? Is twenty six two ninety one. Okay. The way they wrote the quotation up, you'll say okay. deduct for water softener right. system. Okay. okay. I had her give it to me both ways. I said, okay, what's the price of the water softener? Which twenty eight fifty. You roll it all into the water heater, and it's twenty six two ninety one. And if I could, if y'all will indulge me for just a second, we've got. And, you know, my cheese plant as well as my uh, pizza joint out there, we've got very high content of calcium. And I've used, I put one of those water softeners that you described up on b before it goes into the hot water heater. And it does, it, it increases the longevity big time. And uh, the other thing you can do with the electric is pull the elements out every once in a while and just put, soak them in some vinegar. And that'll cut that stuff off. So, but yeah, I, that, I think that's a great idea to put the softener up on the front end. Do you have any idea how many gallons of water uh, flow through that place? I'm, uh, I'm, as 22 years in the plumbing business, I'm yeah. a big fan of water softeners. <laughs> that, uh, that fixes a lot of ills. Well, but, uh, it, it's rated, rated at recovery of 90 gallons per hour. No, no, I mean, how many, how many gallons of water? Do we know how many gallons of water? I the can look that up. I do not have that information. <laughs> and it'd be hard for me to tell on just the hot water side because. No, I meant for the softener because I assume you're going to soften all oh, the water. Oh, the softener, in there. it's. And I didn't give you all this because I didn't get it till later, but it is a 30 gallon a minute. Okay. And the only there will be a uh, there will be a monthly expense as far as the pellets, but they're like five bucks a bag for forty pounds. You probably go through a couple of bags a month at, at the most. Right. So there would be a little minor expense, but I still think that I still think that softener saves you a lot on the on the back end on your hot water heater, this especially hot if water it's all electric. Twenty-four thousand dollars for a hot water heater. <laughs> I think it's well worth the two thousand to protect it. Yeah, and this is an industrial. It's it's the same one that's in there. It's PVI. It's a local company out of Fort Worth that builds these and all the parts. I will say this: the elements are 550 a piece, and there's two of them in it. Now, that's the other reason that I'm going with this unit is I have spares right now that we've been rotating through. And what we do once a month right now, we actually soak them in CLR. We've got it. That'll do it, but vinegar will do it too. Okay. Yeah, vinegar will do it. We'll do that, but at least I'll have spare parts as far as control boards and stuff like that because everything's compatible. But uh, on the downside of it, I think I can cover this right now. I've got about. This kid, can you help Mr. Riley out? We. Okay, that'll be what, perfect. What's your number do you need? Uh, 26291. 
about not to exceed 30,000. I mean, in case you need fittings or stuff like that. Sure. You know, I know what a, you're very cost conscious. Yeah. This yeah. is a hard bid that I just got on March the 1st. So, um, yeah. So, did you, what is this, a buy board or is it yet? You know, oh, yes. And that's the other thing for okay. purchasing. It is, uh, uh, going to be on a TIPS contract number 18010101. Yep. Okay. Judge, I'll make the motion then if for done to uh, approve uh, approval for a new animal control water heater and softener due to the leaks in the current water heater not to exceed $27,000. I'll second that. Okay. Motion been made and second to approve the water heater and water softener for the new animal control. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Again, thank you, Mr. Riley. Thank you. All right, number 16. Uh, discuss and take appropriate action on Texas Association of Counties workers' compensation refund of $4,186 to be placed in a miscellaneous revenue fund, 55. Yes. Boy, we always accept refunds, <laughs> Ms. McCoy. We always budget for workers' <laughs> comp, so when we do get a refund or um, any re rebate or anything, it's just beneficial for us. So we just want to, I've talked with the auditor, and we think that it's best to go in Fund 55, which is capital projects. Okay. Any the reason that we put it there, it doesn't, it's not a benefit to put it back into the line account. It's your business from prior year money is paid anyway, so put it in something that Okay. Okay, good. Any further questions or comments? Do I hear a motion? I make the motion that we deposit the refund of $4,186 into the miscellaneous, miscellaneous revenue fund 55. Second. Second by Mr. Ron Cotton, Commissioner Precinct 2. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Item number 17, the one I was looking for here today. <laughs> Discuss and consider approval for hours work during emergency closure for road ops, road operations. Compensation in lieu of compensatory time and or compensatory time earned. Uh, Ms. Leanne. Yes, so there's, there's no clear direction in the policy other than when you work 40 hours, when you exceed 40 hours, then you earn compensation, comp time at time and a half. The employees that are presented to earn, Mr. Lenny would like to have straight comp time, so it would be, you know, per not time and a half, it would be straight time. Um, none of them worked 40 hours. Unfortunately, that week is a holiday, so you're already starting off with eight hours of holidays. You're not going to work anyways unless you're, you know, come in that day. Um, I know as far as federal, there's no requirement, even if the county shuts down across the board, there's no requirement to pay anyone. So it's a benefit for us to be able to have that time given to us to keep us safe. But as far as the policy, I cannot see where I am to compensate someone for not working over 40 hours. And that's where I need you to come in and tell me what direction you'd like to take. I don't know if Mr. Lenny would like to speak. Well, it's like I started out here this morning and thinking Road Ops and Donald Lenny for all that Road Ops did in this ice storm up here. But we kind of come back to rely upon Road Ops to put sand out and scrape the ice off when it does happen. And nobody in your department worked over 40 hours, did they, Donna? And like I said also, I know that Jay Riley and his maintenance crew, they worked a lot. They were plumbers up there. I mean, I was talking to him every day. So I know that he worked every day. I know that my two 
administrative assistance came in to get out the budget and uh, uh, and then Shannon, I think, came in also. All of them, uh, all of them came in to there get There are out many, the, many employees across yeah, the county. Yeah, many employees came out. That came in. So we need to maybe write it up clear on the thing. It's that had they worked more than 40 hours, I'd be willing to, you know, give them what the handbook says. But mm -hmm. I don't think we can do it in view of the fact that there's so many other employees came to work during that time, Mr. Lenny. So this is not an affront at all to you and your road op crew who do a wonderful job on the deal. But we just can't do it without compensating everybody else and we just can't do it. You got paid for the 40 hours anyway and you're saying that so we don't have to pay, there's just a benefit that There's we no do. federal law that states that we even have to give vacation accruals or sick accruals. There's nothing that states that we are required to do okay. that. Okay. So are you all right with us here, Mr. Lenny, if we don't? No, it's whatever the court decides. Uh, past courts have done it. So, and what we found, and the, you know, some of the emails or some of the, the times that come up, that the, the court decided one way or the other. Okay. I did go back to 2015 and 2013, and I did see that some were compensated for time and a half, even though 40 hours, now this is time and a half paid out that 40 hours were not worked. So um, per policy, I do not agree with that. I don't think it's the right thing to do unless it is approved by the court. I feel the same way. That's the reason why I went okay. straight time. Okay. Uh, legally, I, I don't see how they did it back then, but it was done. So. Okay. Well, do I hear a motion? Well, it well it's to uh, so approval for compens compensation. You're actually wanting money for the employees if they worked during the ice week? No, or, sir, I don't have the budget to, to pay. This would be time. Just compensation at time. At time. And I think you gave me a figure of something like $4,800 is about there, what? There are employees, even though they earn the compensation time, it would still, if they left today, that would affect the budget. <coughs> um, it is not, I've talked with Becky, and it is not in the budget to even approve the time. Um, I know that there is one employee that was specified to be paid out, um, yes. but there's not a budget for that. So I don't know if you really have to take an action. I'm not quite sure, or if you just deny. I've already done the payroll. I can go back and do a correction like I did the weather correction. But you haven't paid, physically paid it? I, no, I okay. did not give any comp time, and I did not pay any comp time out for that department. Okay. Now, any department. For any department. Now, one employee did work 37 hours, and when you work in, an, in a week that has a holiday, then you, once you get to an amount, so he worked 37 hours, he earned five hours of holiday time. So he did earn some. One employee. One. But nobody else. No, sir. You know, the only thing, the only thing we have here is that road operations is public safety. That's the only thing we've got to go on if we made a decision to, to do something for road office. They are, they were out there for public safety. But I guess we're public too for the people that had to come in the office. Uh, they are part of the public and risk whatever they do. So, I, you know, it's, it's, it's really not a, it's not an easy decision, but we better do something. We have to, we got to direct you what to do. I agree with that. And it's right that you bring it to court because you don't have, I read the policy. I can't find it in a policy where we can do that. Mm -hmm. Nor, I don't know what happened before I got on the court, but I hadn't seen it before. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that I guess that's why they put us up here, make that decision. Well, if we just take no action, then it, that would just end it just by taking no action because if we do it for one department, you, to be fair, you would have to do it for everybody else who came in 
and that's a lot of different people. And I don't guess we have it budgeted for all the other people that came in during that time, do we? Yeah. Because Donald keeps a he keeps a full staff ninety nine percent of the time. He's he's one of the lucky ones and that would that would impact his budget. It's unfortunate that some employees stayed home all week and some employees came in. I, mean, I had an employee that was begging me to come in to help me with the payroll and I chose not to just because I wanted her to be safe. Um, so it is unfortunate that things like that happens. Um, I mean, it happens everywhere. Okay. Next time we get sure, we'll pick her up. <laughs> okay. Well, she could have came in. If I could add this just to maybe, maybe we can button this up, and it's certainly no offense to Mr. Lenny at all, but I would make a motion that we decline uh, the approval of hours worked and compensation or compensation in lieu of compensatory time and or compensatory time earned with road ops at this time. Does that, did that sound right? It sounds yeah. perfect. Motion been made by Commissioner Eagle to uh, not approve the request by road ops for the compensation time during the ICE storm. For all the reasons we stated. Yeah, for all the reasons we stated. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Wilson. Uh, uh, Cotton. Did you get, yeah. Oh. oh. No, it's, he's closer to you than I am. Let him. Well, he got my left ear. Too close. He's, yeah, he, he's a millisecond. Then the judge is good here. Jiffy, <laughs> which is a, a hundredth of a second closer. So we got a motion and second. Any further discussion or questions? I'm a little concerned. I'm a little, I've struggled with this thing because we're asking these guys, uh, why not just stay home? Is this, am I getting this right? They're, they're getting paid 40 hours whether they're coming to work or staying home. And, and we're asking these guys to come out and uh, in, in some kind of hazardous situations. I'd, <laughs> That's something that the, you know, the, the needs to be looked at. Do what? I think that's something that needs to be looked at. It's a different issue. It's not this issue. No. And no. this is where As Melissa whole. and I can come in and, and start working on this policy and get it tweaked. It should be looked at, but it needs to be looked at across the county. Yes. That's you know, correct. Head asked an employee to come in during a declared disaster, which I believe that's what that week was. Yes, I did then the court needs to look at it across the county, not just one particular department. That's what I said. I mean, they Riley's mean, maintenance crew work a lot of hours, probably more hours than road ops did. Well, we didn't exceed 40 for the week. Yeah, you didn't exceed the 40, but right. you got paid for the 40, but you did work a lot of hours, and it's the You're same. You're trying to make a different point. No, no, I'm yeah, not doing it. Try it again. I, I think he's trying to make a different point. Yeah, I'm like, why, why would somebody leave the house? To come to work, you, uh, we need this you, county to function you, during these things. And uh, somebody saying, "Hey, I'm gonna get paid 40 hours for sitting here next to the fire," <laughs> or I can go climbing a dump truck out in the cold. And and you know, I think that that's a. Uh, and there again, in the future, maybe the court might decide not to pay during a closure. So it could be different. I mean, that's not required of us. Else. Yeah, we could say you could stay home if you want. Yeah, or you have, and many counties do. I've talked to other treasurers. When they close down, you're still required to come in. If you feel like you cannot come in, you use vacation time. So it can happen that way. That's something I'd like to see looked at. I don't know what, uh, you know, yeah. because that... Uh, yeah. Something that, as a whole we need to look at, but it'll be, you know, in effect the whole county. Well, does does the sheriff stay home? Does your deputy stay home if it's bad? No, oh, they're working just like every other day, and then some extra on those kind of days. And I yeah, I think we need to look at it, but not today. Yeah, no. <laughs> As a court, you want to look at it, 
I mean, if I'm working on a current policy. Why don't you work on one and bring one? Then if you're the you're HR, do you, could you work on that? Correct. And, and I've got one pretty well completed. I've checked around with other counties. Now, I've not one time come across a county that does not give their employees a pay, paid leave during a, a declared disaster. Now, Leanne may have some that she's visited with, but I have not. So again, that's going to be up to the court. Either way. Well, you know, we leave, we can't talk about it unless we do it here or have a workshop. But we could have right. you start. You could have the human resources start with something and see if it fits to what we bring it to court and and uh, and give us a shot at it. And then we can decide. Okay. Well, the motion did made and second to. Um, not allow for all the reasons that were stated, mainly because the other departments had worked and the budget is, everybody's been paid according to this. And like I said, Mr. Don Lenny, I, you know what high regard I personally have and the whole commissioner's court have of your road ops and what y'all do in bad weather and everything. But with that, I go ahead and call. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? I abstain. Come on, make the hard it's decision. Gonna Kevin, it's gonna Kevin, be you're up here now. This is a hard decision. No longer I'm sitting guy. here looking at my friend, Donald Lenny, that I called up at 11 o'clock and had to ask him to help out text dot. That's what I really thought on the deal. You can't abstain. I'm not going to accept Well, I wanted to put a motion out to table this and talk about it again later, but there was already one on the table, so. Okay. <laughs> motion passes four with one abstention. <laughs>